G'day, g'day, Nick. Welcome back. G'day, Tom. Great to be back. It's week two, episode two. Can you believe it? We've, we've come back for more. From how we started to where we are, it uh, looks like the, the crowds have doubled, <laughs> maybe tripled. We started with two people. Now we've got, uh, there's how many in the room now? One, two, three, six. We're six of us. So if this were during lockdown, we'd be locked up. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so welcome to Uzo Talk, everyone, for episode two. And um, this time, would you believe we actually have a sponsor? Meet the Greek in Brighton La Sands. We do, Tom. Yeah, the Mujos family, fantastic family, have uh, reached out and given us some support to assist us with our second podcast. Actually, I was there this afternoon, actually, had a look around. They're doing some renos, which is a really good thing. They're sprucing up the place. But we should, uh, yeah, we should get down there, Tom. Yeah, absolutely stunning Greek food, which we've really missed during lockdown. I've been there a whole bunch of times. You've been there for for any special occasions or taking the taking the missus down there? <laughs> Definitely, Tom. Uh, at least half a dozen times I've been down yeah. there. Uh, good thing is I don't really uh, order anything. I just get the banquet. It's like a, a ten course degustation. Hmm. So anything you think of, it comes out, and you usually leave with a doggy bag. You'll never finish yeah. all the food they give you. It's all gondosuvli, it's all on charcoal, it's beautiful meats, the lamb, they got the best. seafood, octopus, whatever you can think of. And it's not your traditional uh, Greek restaurant either. It doesn't have the, the columns and the fishing nets everywhere. It's actually more of a, yeah, it's, it's interesting. You walk in there and it's, uh, it's like, a, a, like a mountainous scene. It's, right. it's like you're in a cave possibly. Yeah. And uh, it's got images of all the, the Mugios clan uh, on photos stuck on mm. planks of wood. With uh, Greek sayings, which will, uh, which I'm sure will come through these podcasts more <laughs> often than not. But yeah, no, it's really good. It's down at Brighton La Sands, so they'll be, they should be open by uh, first week of December, ready for summer. Fantastic. So, well, th- well, thank you to the Mujos family for getting behind Uzo Talk. We really, really, really appreciate that, and uh, we can't wait to actually be back on site and uh, being able to eat the food again. Yeah, definitely. And they have uh, live music as well, which uh, which would be a nice segue to our segment. I think so. We have a very special episode for you today, and we've brought in some uh, similar experts in, the, in, that, in, in that sort of vein. Uh, whilst I might dabble in a bit of bouzouki... Um, <laughs> You're very good, and, Tom. I'm just, no, Don't I'm underplay not. it. I'm not, I'm not. If I am good at it at all, it's, uh, it's thanks to the two blokes that are here with us today. Uh, we're joined by one of Australia's best bouzouki repairers. <laughs> <laughs> bouzouki repair extra- extraordinaire, it Peter Apostolidis. And uh, a local Buzuki player and Buzuki teacher, George Kalapitas. Welcome, boys. How are we? Good, good. How are you? All Very well. <laughs> we're, we're, we're really happy to see you. We're really happy that we can all be in the same room together. <laughs> so I think we should have a drink. What do you reckon? I think so, mate. It's that time. Fantastic. Let's get into it. Yeah, my boys. Yeah, yeah. Good to see you, boy. This. Yes, you. A couple of legends in the house. All right. So, what are we drinking today? Uh, we actually moved over to uh, Uzo Twelve, so we're trying that today. So we've got. Uh, what did we have? We had half a bottle when we walked in, and there's nothing in it now. <laughs> and there's a full bottle of Blomardi next to it, ready to go, ready and raring. What do you reckon? Are we going to get through the whole thing? Look, I so, think we will. It's always a good start if we're halfway through a bottle already. <laughs> <laughs> So. I'd, I'd like to say I'd like to say that we drank that before you guys came, but it, it's not true. <laughs> <laughs> but it is true. <laughs> <laughs> it can be true. <laughs> long, long night, boys. Long night ahead. Uh, so, how do you guys drink your uzo? Are you, are you big uzo drinkers, or do you, do you drink something else? For me, uh, uzo has got to be part of a special occasion. Okay. I wouldn't go out of my way to have the uzo. Tupuro, I would. Okay. Um, <laughs> especially at night when it helps with sleeping, but. Um, Uzo has got to be part of a very special occasion. Fantastic. So I just take it plain with ice. Beautiful. Fantastic. Fine. And what about you, George? For me, it's, um, the more spirity the Uzo is, the better it is. I think there's a lot of uh, sweet liqueur type Uzo's out there that I'm not too much of a fan of because mm-hmm. I'm more a big Scotch drinker. I drink myself a Scotch okay, every few good. nights. Good, nice. And love you know, Uzo's Scotch. representative of the, the flavors of Greece. So something that's a bit spirity and has those involved yeah beautiful so yeah. what do you think it's of the uso 12 it's good i like it yeah, yeah it's up there more more of the vodka brand than i am a plomati brand but 
Okay. Yeah. Ooh, okay. Let's see a bit of controversy mm. around uh, controversy with that guy as well comment. because a lot of people say it's not actually Greek owned. Oh. So it's owned by the same company that uh, that makes Sambuca. I really? Think. Yes. So it's made in the same factory. Mm. So it was Greek though originally. It was, originally it was Greek. Same recipe, I believe. Yes. Yeah, but it's been taken over. So, you know, the purists will argue this is not a Greek drink anymore. That's why we've got two of them here today. Another debate. Okay. <laughs> what about the Plumari? Is that Greek? That's, uh, supposedly. Okay. It is. Okay. From supposedly. the island of Lisbon. But they still come in those um, the packages with the, the poster that comes out of the mermaid? Well, this this one didn't. But oh, no. I've never gotten a poster. But now oh. I feel gypped. <laughs> well, how are we getting this poster? <laughs> Quite interestingly, uh, I was reading the other day that we have many different beers in Greece, about 30 different types. We do. Mm. Uh, which is very interesting. Yeah, the beer conversation, beer. that could be another podcast. Yeah. That'll take an hour. Greek, Greek beers. <laughs> I, I, like them all I love my beer. I think we love any alcohol, don't we, Tom? Yep, absolutely. Yeah, we're we not start alcoholics. off with Uzo because we're talking <laughs> <laughs> we lose a talk, but <laughs> we're not alcoholics, I promise. <laughs> well, it wouldn't be a Greek podcast if it didn't have the ouzo on the table. So exactly. Yeah, so we've got ouzo, we've got some, uh, we've got some tarama, we've got figs, we've got cheeses and uh, cucumber, yeah, all that Mediterranean stuff. olives. Yep. Nick's put on a spread again. <laughs> <laughs> well, you just can't have it like that. You can have something with Th- it. Thank you, Nico. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Bravo, Nico. Mezadakia, boy, this it's normal. <laughs> <laughs> That's That's it. It. Which is what we had last hey, week. Tora. Ah, this is Nico. <laughs> go and make some tiakan. Episode three. <laughs> so, Episode Tom, uh, I'm going to put you on the spot here. Yeah, go on. Uh, Uzo 12, what's mm-hmm. the story? Or Blomati? For, for, for me personally, it's Blomati. Um, mm-hmm. I think, but I think part of the reason is because, we, you know, growing up, everyone's got a bad story to tell about drinking Uzo. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm no different, unfortunately. And yeah, in this particular case, Dodeka was the was the one that did it to me. Okay. Uh, <laughs> managed to get over it now. But and it leaves a mark, doesn't it? It really yeah. does. <laughs> the smell. <laughs> the, t- <laughs> the, fa- the fact that I can be in the same room as, a, as an open bottle is unbelievable in itself. But, you know, we, we've, we've grown to re-like it again. Yeah. Was it one of the first users that came out to Australia? I think it was. That was the one that, for example, my papa would always have. Mm. Um, so even now, you know, go over to his place and he's still got, you know, like one or two bottles sitting on the shelf there. Mm. Uh, but... You know, Papu being a creature of habit, the way the majority of the oldies are, yeah. um, he will all. You know, he's he's bought one type of uzo and he's just stuck to it. He, there's no, you know, there's no, no way. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> love it. Exactly. Yeah, I guess we're all being scarred. You know, eighteen year olds starting to drink, and that's all we had. Uzo twelve. So I can imagine a lot of us have been I'm, scarred by uzo. 12. I'm sensing a story here as well. Oh, there here we is, go. That's there two is. out of six. <laughs> <laughs> no, look, I don't mind it. It's actually good. It, the memories do come back sipping this. It seems a little bit harsh going down, sort of smooth as Plumadi. I find Plumadi a lot smoother. Uh, again, it, it could be those stories coming back. But look, I'm not going to get into those <laughs> alcoholic stories. Uh, we're not here for that. Aren't we? <laughs> Uh, don't know. We, got, we, can, we can diverse. Bit, yeah. We definitely can, but we got we two special Why not? guests here. This, this but we pod- want to hear your story as yeah. well. Don't, don't. Okay, I need a lot more drink <laughs> to come out with those stories. Yeah. All right, a lot re- more. Circle back. <laughs> Maybe to the end of the podcast, they might. Let, come let's out. see how we go. Okay, yeah. just remember that thought, Peter. All right. So before we do anything, uh, given that this is a podcast about Buzuki, I think it would be remiss of us. Not to actually hear some. So, George, you've got your buzuki there. Can you uh, just give us a few notes? Beautiful. Love it. Stunning, mate. Absolutely beautiful. Put you in a trance every time I hear it. Peter, you worked on this particular buzuki. Um, and right. look, you've got a bit of a reputation as a, you know, being someone who really knows what they're doing when it comes to, you know, to fixing these things. And I've seen it firsthand um, with my own instruments. So just so everyone knows, virtually every, every buzuki player in Australia that you may have, may have seen or heard of may have actually gone through Peter. He's that good. Uh, he's looking. <laughs> Come on, please. He's, he's also very modest. He's very modest. He's looking very modest. He's, he's looking at Shaking us now, going, like, "What are you saying, mate?" <laughs> Come on, I heard your garage is full of buzogia. You're fixing what? Broken ones, yes. Yeah, That's right. <laughs> but what, why? That's why do you do it? You. Why do you do what you do? I also play buzogia. I started when I was ten, hmm. and I actually picked it up because Dad wanted 
his sons to learn music. I wasn't into music that much. Mm. I was a lot more into sport. So at some point in my life, I had a bit of an injury and he found the opportunity to take me to the Lefko Pirgo in Enmore, the oldies will remember. And there was a buzuki hanging in the, um, in the vitrina there and he said, do you like that? And I said, okay, I've got nothing to do for a year. <laughs> it was exactly what he wanted. So Beautiful. I grabbed it and um, that's how I started. So I was always a hands-on person. So grandma would take me to Woolies and Coles when mm. I was two, three, four years old. She'd say, what, what do you want me to buy you? And I always would go for those little tool sets, you know, right. mm, you know okay. screwdrivers. And, and Timber always spoke to me for some reason. Um, and then, you know, that was the basis. And Dad helped in my sort of education of, because he, he was a tool setter. So mm -hmm. the background, and Papu was also, you know, a, a shoemaker. So it runs right. in the family. But I was always intrigued with, woodwork mm. for some reason learning the buzuki then i not only had the the desire to get better with pl playing the get, getting these notes right mm. but it also intrigued me how these notes came out so right. what made the buzuki make the sound and why some buzuki are better than others and it always intrigued me but like all of us i never had the guts to you know go beyond and mm. because obviously there was no one to show us interesting so in 2000, um, we would go back and forward to Greece with my wife and we had a bit of a, a stint there for a couple of years because the family business needed us. What part of Greece? My wife is from Kalamata, but Beautiful. she's part Czech, part mm -hmm. from right. Kalamata. Is that where the olives are better than bread of and butter? Course, of course, <laughs> okay, <yes. laughs> of course. And... Um, at the time, my, my first buzuki teacher, which is now here, Manolaki, was in Greece doing his own thing, his career path, and um, I contacted him and I went and found some maker. His name was Zaharia then, he's not alive now. And I purchased this gorgeous buzuki, you've seen it, and George has seen it. Mm. It was something unique, mm. but it didn't have the playability that I wanted. So I would constantly go back to him because I, I thought I was like I knew Manoli I'd, Manoli I've got to go see mm. him yep. mm. was it the sound or was it the, it was the, the, the playability it wasn't okay. it wasn't so it's not only the sound just with, explain to yeah okay so it's there. with, with instruments guitars any mm -hmm. string instrument it's not about the sound only it's about mm -hmm. the playability the the ability okay. to be able to do things you know have the action at a certain height mm -hmm. and a certain ease so, okay. so the feel of it, the, the feel, fingers. yeah, yeah. Okay. So once you get pressure, once you get the feel that you like, you can excel because it allows you. The, the, so instruments. This is what got me into it. Instruments mm. talk to you. Mm. Okay, so you try, you you battle with your own demons to try and do specific things on the instrument, but the instrument is saying to you, "Mate, I'm not going to do that. What you want, mm. you know, because I'm not set up for that." So I had this particular problem with this instrument. It was gorgeous, you know, it was fully handmade, mm -hmm. but obviously the playability wasn't there. So I'd go back constantly to him and in the end, like typical old Greeks, he'd say to me, oh, it can't be done, it can't be done, it can't be done. I said, I just spent, you know, two and a half thousand dollars or three thousand dollars. Yeah, well, that's it. <laughs> But then, <clears throat> yep. but at the same time, I was sort of, you know, it got to the point where I was getting frustrated. Mm. So I had a bit of timber knowledge, and, mm -hmm. but my main concern was I couldn't get material. We, mm. I couldn't get frets, I couldn't get uh, bone, I couldn't get all these things, and, and I was looking for okay. supplies. So what, what, what makes a good, what timber makes a good buzuki? So generally we use hard timbers like mm -hmm. solid ti stable timbers we we we, we more call, we, not so much hard timbers because there are other hard timbers that are not very effective for for instrument making mm -hmm. so the basic ones are even for guitars and for violins and all that mm -hmm. are your maples your you know your okay. things what about walnut i read walnut, walnut tree yeah, was wal a famous one for walnut Greek is very walnut is very um specific to buzuki because it gives that warm sound Okay. So it's like mahogany. Mahogany is the same type of sounding mm. timber, but they're all hardwoods. Okay. George, what do you have there? What were you playing just then? 
Well, Peter probably has a, a better idea of um, what this is made. This is yeah. Th so, walnut so the as back, well, isn't it? so the back of this is walnut. This that's very it is walnut. Yeah, okay. that's very typical of uh, bouzouka. Mm. And the front, the, the the top, the kapaki, which we call, is always spruce. So it's mm. the spruce family. Okay. Spruce is used because it's very light, but very very flexible and, and hard. I, I think that would be another podcast yeah. i think you, mm. you get into technical so i remember having the conversation with you that different woods you know emit different sounds you get your your more trebly sort of sound you get your sweeter sound your more mellow more mm -hmm. bassier sort of tunes mm, and right. and some of the makers even go to the extent of mixing the woods um both on on the back and the front of the buzuki and um i know i've bought a few and i've, I've shown you a few that have, have had that and I've done my fair share of um, traveling through Greece, different buzuki shops, trying to find the right wine. And it's it's not an easy task because there's so many makers out there. Yeah, there's so yeah. many different ways of making them. And this, and it's like yeah. an alchemy. Like ev every piece of log has got its own character. Mm. And every section of that log has its own character. So mm. you may buy a log, split it into three or four, make three, four, five different buzuki, but they all will be different mm. because... Every instrument has its own character. Every pane of timber that goes through, every run of timber has got its own character. So yeah. this is what fascinated me too in the beginning. Mm. But how I got into it, your, your initial question was that I got frustrated with these guys telling me I couldn't have the instrument that I wanted, mm -hmm. even though mm. they had made it. Mm. So I, got, I came back and got some rolls of toilet paper and put my buzuki on there. I, soon, I found some, some fret wire, some guys that I found here and I found a wholesaler actually and then I said to my wife what's the worst that can happen I'll just pull it apart and if I mm. manage to to ruin it then I'll just go back to Greece and fix it and that's how it started yeah. so reverse um, engineering just re break it apart have just, a look yeah yeah just well, new so how I mean for, for me as a I've been a guitar player for 20 years and you know I've only recently started playing buzuki I've always had issues, for example, with, you know, the playability, you know, the action on the, on, the, on, the, on the instrument and whatnot, but I've never had the balls enough to say, I'm going to try and fix it myself. I'm too scared to. What made you confident enough that you weren't going to fuck this instrument up? Because I'm a firm believer that whatever man can create, he can recreate. Yep. Okay. So the, it's, if you've made this from a lump of wood, do not tell me that you can not reverse engineer it. Yep. I mean, there's got to be a point where you can take it to and then fine. When you, get to, when, you, when you reach that limit, you'll say then, well, yes, you know, it's got to be pulled apart and then reconstructed. Yeah. But there's got to be a fine line where you can take this to. There's got to be a point where you can push yeah. the boundaries. And this is what I found in the last 10 years doing the stuff in, in, in the garage. Every instrument has its own unique yeah. character. Every instrument will allow you to do some things and some not. Mm -hmm. Um, but you've got to be able to foresee these things and portray them to the to the customer and say, right. well, I can take it to that point. There is a risk, but I'm pretty sure I can get it to that. And then you just see when when you dropped your bazooka off and yep. George drops it, I will sit and play mm. the thing, and then I'll hang it and then I'll talk to it for a couple of days. I'll I'll pick well, it up again and you know like get that get accustomed to the instrument and yep. then I'll go and do the repair because I then I know what this instrument, what yeah. this timber is and, and going to allow me to do. The important thing for me to mention here is because, yeah, like you just mentioned, I gave you my buzuki and that was a really important instrument for me because it was, it had a lot of sentimental value given that it was the last gift that my papu in Greece got for me. When I had initially started playing it around 20 odd years ago, I very quickly outgrew it because it had, uh, you know, it had a problem in the neck. And 10 years ago, I think I remember, remember telling you, I took it to someone here, we won't mention who it was, and they basically told me, it's rubbish, chuck it out, you can't fix it. It's I've not. heard that many times. Yeah, yeah. and so you were the first person to say, no, <laughs> this, is, this is a good instrument. You know, the, the underlying bones of this is worth repairing and worth saving. Let's see what we can do with it. You know, when people bring, bring you a buzuki now, do you automatically think everything's worth saving or, or are there some that you see that are, that are too far gone? If it's sentimental, like George's buzuki, which he just played on, yep. I said the same thing to him. Like, do you really want to go ahead with this? I did exactly the same thing that I did to yours. I pulled it apart, pulled the neck apart, put a truss rod in it. Hmm. But for you guys, it was more of a sentimental thing. There's always a, a dollar value and there's always a point where you will say it's no longer worth going beyond that point. There have been very few instruments that have come through my hands that I've said, no, nah, it's probably one or two. 
Mm. But they were in really bad shape. Yeah. Um, or was it worth it to repair it, them? Well, it is. It, no, it's not worth it in the ens- essence of dollar value. Mm-hmm. Because if you really want that instrument, anything can be done. Mm. But then I can't guarantee... If we get to that point of repair, then I can't guarantee you sound. I can't guarantee you... Right. It's more mm. sound. Yeah. Because with instruments and guitar players and mm-hmm. bouzouki players, especially bouzouki players, it's sound that gets us. We, we may struggle an eternity to find one instrument that we really like in our yeah. lifetime mm. just amazing listening to you guys speak you know i'm not very musically minded but hearing that connection from person to bouzouki it's there's no such thing as a, a production line of a bouzoukia. it's just it seems like it's very customized you tune it to the player his fingers i guess the length of his arm it's and that's exactly right george mm. uh, nick th- that was my problem that i faced when i went to greece the makers not all of them Mm -hmm. but very specific well very generalized makers don't sit down they don't do the job as a luthier they Mm. do it as a businessman Mm. so effectively what you've got to do is sit down with that person and ask them what do they need what do they want out of the instrument we all want different things Mm. give me an example what would they ask for what so what what do you mean they need so with bouzouki because it's a lead instrument Mm -hmm. we all want a very low action Mm-hmm. A low action gives you, as I pointed out before, mm-hmm. a low action gives you the ability to do th- certain things that you can't on a high action. You go a bit quicker. You've got more stamina when you play for a long period of time. Yeah. Okay. So it makes it string, much easier to play. Yeah. Mm-hmm. If the string is very high off the fretboard and you're doing, you know, riffs, mm-hmm. it's very hard. You you get tired if the string is sitting very high above the fretboard. So you want it as low as possible without causing any buzzing, without causing any, you know, different weird tones and stuff like that. Mm. So there is a limit where every every instrument will allow you to get Mm. to. And then with that instrument, you've also got to ask the player what they want. Some players like a very low action. Some players Mm -hmm. like a very high action. Some players like a very specific tone. You know, when you lower the strings, you get a different tone. When you leave the strings high, you get a different tone again. Mm. So it gets very mathematical and scientific. Mm, very if technical and very personal. Well, it's very scientific. Mm. I remember watching a guy on YouTube that was, he was a, uh, a mathematician. Mm-hmm. But like, like me, he was, you know, his part-time thing was repairing guitars in the garage. Mm. And he tried to implement mathematics onto onto guitars and how to build guitars and try to get two guitars exactly the same, okay. which is impossible. Really? Okay. So he implemented his four unit mathematics to try and implement, you know, to get these, but you can't. It doesn't matter what you do. Every instrument has its own personality. Wow. You can never have two guitars no, exactly the no, same. No. It's or very, two bouzouki in this case. No. Mm. You can, a maker will tell you, we're talking about bouzouki. You'll get a maker that will make five bouzouki. Mm-hmm. The two will be awesome. The three will be mediocre. Mm. That's just the nature of the beast. Wow. George, what's your style? What, what do you prefer? For me, it just it depends. I mean, I've, I think my style of what bouzouki I've bought over the course of me playing is, mm-hmm. has changed. I used to go for ones that were very low action, mm-hmm. you know, allowed me to play very quick and for long periods of time. But now I'm, I'm starting to, to gear towards more of the, what does it sound like acoustically? Um, mm. That's the number one. Okay, I think. So when you mean low action, it means your fingers are going 100 miles an hour. Yeah, and I, and I don't tire because you don't have to press very hard on the strings to get there. Okay. Um, but then I'm noticing now that when the action's too low, you don't get that tonality that you really want. Um, especially if you're playing acoustically at home, it's like if you whack out an electric guitar without plugging it into an amp, you mm-hmm. get that sort of very muted sort of but not very resonating sort of sound that you get to it and um yeah some people like it some people like that um me personally i I like to hear it i like to feel Mm. it because as you know the bouzouki's got a big bulb at the back and Mm -hmm. you're hugging it all the time and you want to feel the the sound resonate from it it's Mm. okay so for example you've you've got this particular bouzouki here that you've got today Mm. how much of what you're listening to at the time so say, for example, you're listening to, you know, old Rebetica or yeah. whatever the case is. How much of what you're listening to right now influences what you prefer to play and the sound that you prefer from an instrument? I think as people are starting to learn bouzouki, and I've noticed this with a lot of my students, they'll yep. start out liking a lot of the modern music. Yep. 
like what they hear at weddings and they hear, you know, a bazooki player play over the top of your top 40 Greek hits. <laughs> yep. Is that ever the here? Uh, yeah. <laughs> no. It would it's be a lot of the stairway to heaven for yeah, guitar players. <laughs> it's a bit like that. <laughs> Every bazooki player plays it. <laughs> they should have it in bazooki shops, like a sign that says no yeah. evdoki are being played. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I've noticed that a lot of them want to just solo over the top of music, like they'll hear at a wedding or something like that. And, and then once they start to actually learn about the buzuki, mm-hmm. they dial it back from your, your top 40 hits all the way back to your rebetika, even the 1920s sort of way mm. of playing buzuki. Because I think a lot of the students start to learn the essence of what music is. They learn the freedom of flowing between scales. They, they know how minor scales and, and all the variations in Greek, especially minor scales, invoke certain emotions. Yep. Um, and the way you solo across them versus the major scales. And as their knowledge expands, their, what they're interested in in a bazooki also expands. So early on, I was very similar. I wanted the top 40 hits. I wanted yep. something that was low action. I could play very quick. But now getting ahead um, in my, I guess, my development of, of bazooki, I've, I've come to Peter with a, with a few different bazooki and, and he's sort of tweaked them to make sure that they're, they're resonating the sound that, they were intended for yeah um you know it's obviously this one's made what with walnut and and cedar so what sort of sounds are they meant to have i think this particular one that he's talking about when i first brought it to peter it was very it wasn't emitting much sound at all it didn't have a truss rod and i had taken it to someone initially who heated up the neck and that was the way of sort oh. of yeah. For those who can't see, Peter's yeah. just slapped his forehead. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's the absolute kiss of death. Because we will very well know that when you heat up wood, it's to bend it. Yep. So mm. you've softened the fibres up. And yeah. that's exactly the opposite of what you want in mm. that situation. Okay. And there's no going back from that. There's really, no going there? back. Once you... Yeah, like a lot heat of things in life. So <laughs> once, you, <laughs> once you've heated and bend it, that's it. Yeah. So you've got to find a way to stabilise it. Unfortunately, with bazooka and the timber that's used in Australia, we have this problem that's called uh, condensation and humidity. Mm. So I am very a, a strong advocate of um, using truss rods, yep. which has been used in guitars for 120 yeah. years now. And actually, it was a Greek that um, designed the first truss rod and Isn't then was used right? by Gibson. Yes, yes. Well, I didn't know that. from? Ipiro. Really? <laughs> <laughs> Seems like a top bloke. Yeah. Was he a cousin of He's yours? A good man. I think I, yeah, I think I am related to him. Okay. Yeah, it's all it's all engineering. I, uh, I'll if we've got some time, I'll t- tell you a very funny story in my first uh, steps. Yeah, well, we've got in the garage, time, I think. Yeah. Well, well, I pull myself another Ruzo. Yeah. Well, yeah. Let, let me let me hit you up. Anyone need a top up? Need I, a top I, up uh, here? I had some yeah, mentors which sure. were giving me all these, a wholesaler. So mm-hmm. he was giving me all these timbers and they ac- a- actually, they're in, here in Sydney, mm-hmm. but they taught me how to spray as well, which was very... How to spray? Spray, yeah. What's that? The spray that the clears and the colours and all that on the okay. instruments and all that. You mean like painting it? Painting it, yeah. Okay. But yeah. We, I use, we use a specific type of clear. We don't use a mm-hmm. polyurethane. I use a very, it's called a guitar lacquer, mm-hmm. which... Um, when it dries, it dries very hard mm. and l- allows the instrument to resonate. How do you, how do you get all the fancy lines at the back of the bazooki? It looks like a... Like oh, a, that's a story. Yeah, a that's another story. Shell. So, I, I can talk forever, honestly. Um, <laughs> no, I think you can. Be, How long have we got, Tom? Because, uh, as long as you want. Because um, <laughs> I actually we should... actually want to hear a bit of bazooki later on. We should, go on. We should mention um, the history of bazooki. We were going to... Yeah, we're going to okay, go on to we're that. we're going to get to that. The right? history of a string... The first written history of a string instrument was... In Greek mythology, when uh, Hermes built the lyra, right, uh, he grabbed the turtle and um, decapitated it, or whatever, and he turned it upside down and then put three strings, and hence we have the Cretan lyra. Yep. Are you kidding? And then Hermes, what year was that? Oh, <laughs> Ten thousand BC or long something. Time yeah, ago. Yeah, a long time ago. <laughs> and then we also have the nine muses, where we see the uh, replication of the buzuki, but yep. it was called taburas. Yes. Uh, and um, is that ba- like Pandurida? Pandura? What's Pandura? Ba- Pandurida. Pandurida. Okay. That's what it was called. Pandurida. Look at you go, Nick. Oh, good you know, good man. Did did a, very good. Did a research for a non musa Very good, mate. <laughs> so well, you asked George before, what is it that we Buzuki players um, search for? Mm-hmm. We all have some kind of memory that comes with being born 
in this culture. Mm. And because the, the, the particular instrument has a history going back thousands of years, mm. inevitably you start off with the riffs and the, the new stuff and the new age stuff, but then the buzuki has so much history that you, you, d- you start dwelling on that. Mm. So you start searching on why do, you know, why did they play like this in the 50s? Why all the, the, the great songs were born in the 50s and the 60s and mm. the 70s, you know? And these were people that were not uneducated. But I hear you, because when I listen to the buzuki, it's like I'm in a trance. So It's very transient. Yeah. You know, I listen to it, I just stop. Everything around me just yeah. goes And, and buzuki blank. has, it's one of the instruments that is a dialogue. And this is why I went back to ancient Greek history, yeah. where you don't find this music, you don't find any other music, so you start off with an intro, mm-hmm. the buzuki starts with an intro, then you go to the singer. Then mm-hmm. midway you'll say adapocrisy, so the buzuki will talk again, and then you go to the singer. Yeah. So there's always this dialogue mm. happening between the singer and the instrument mm-hmm. so because it's a lead instrument. So it has a lot of history and a lot of soul. When you master the, 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 the playability of it, then you soul search. Mm. Yeah. Well, that's what it does. It taps into the core of you, your senses. And we probably don't realise, maybe it is in our DNA, there's something about it. When you hear it, everything just stops. Is, is that what attracted you to playing it, George? Yeah, I mean, for, for me, when I was a, a young kid, I guess, I used to hear the taksimi at the beginning of a mm. song when I was uh, at the Kazi Club back in the day. <laughs> and I used to be like, oh my God, I wish I could do something like that. that that's really cool. It's like he's talking. But he's not talking. It's all through through notes, and um, and I, I would notice that different buzuki players that would get up would do a different taksimi depending on the song, yep. mm. and they'd put their own sort of flair to it, their own emotion. It's like they were all telling a different story of what the song means to them, mm. and I find you don't have that with a lot of other cultures in music, and that's what really drew me to it. And then yeah, so yeah. I've just I've always wanted to learn since I was. Uh, as old as I could listen to music and know what music mm. was. Yeah. How did you actually start playing? So I started, or oh, would have been about, I was what, 10, 12 years old, something like that. Right. And um, I'd always wanted to obviously play buzuki. I was always listening to Greek music and mm. dad sort of entrenched that in whatever he was playing in Were the car. Were you born here in Australia? I was born here in Australia, yeah. Fourth, what about your dad? Fourth genera- he was born here as well. So wow. um, yeah, our parents came out poor. 1914, our grand, great-grandparents so now. your great-grandparents yeah. came from where? Came from Castellorizo. Are you kidding? You're yeah. a Kazi. Kazi, Kazi boy, yeah. So <laughs> 1914, they came out. 19, so your grandparents were born in Australia. Grandparents were born here for the most part. My yaya was um, born in Egypt. But um, but the rest of them, their parents are all from Castellorizo. Yeah. That blows me away. That just blows me away. And yeah. you're still, you're very Greek. Yeah. I'll try to try to retain it as much as I can. Your great grandparents came here. It's again. Yeah. That's what we talked about in our first podcast. That's what I was going to mm. say. Like you know, no matter how far it goes, something is going to bring you back to it. Whether it's the sound of a buzuki, whether it's yeah, the um, just can't stuff the it out. Whatever it is, mm. we, you know, we said yeah, four hundred years of occupation and somehow our race never disappeared. Never yeah. went away. This is exactly why the Greeks shouldn't be afraid today. Because we've been through worse situations yeah. and have survived. Mm. You know, my fam- my wife's half Czech, mm-hmm. but I've managed to be, you know, the, the tyrant in my family. But um, <laughs> <laughs> I've got my kids, you know, dancing in uh, Pondian, which is yep. part Beautiful. of my heritage. But that, that just yeah. really blows me away. Your yeah. great grandparents great grandparents yeah. came here to Australia, yeah. and their great grandson now is so adapted in the Greek culture, the Greek music. I guess in our family, Greek. Music has always been carried down through generation to generation. Mm. I think my grandmother used to always sing songs, wow. you know, old old Greek songs that she used to love, and then mm. her parents used to sing mm. them to her. We've still got old LP records at home wow. um, from our great great grandparents. That mm-hmm. because the island was run by um, the Venetians for almost a hundred years. Was it Venetians? Yeah, okay. the Venetians well, had the well. island, so everyone had to learn mandolin. Mm. So um, there's oh, old. Really? We've got okay. old records at home of people, you know playing mandolin and, and singing old traditional Kazi songs. So okay. it's all that sort of culture that's passed down generation through generation. And I think that's, what, it's, what is it, nature versus nurture? I think it's a mm. bit of both with, mm. with Buzuki um, or with, with Greekness. Mm. Yeah. No, wow. Amazing. Well, we, we touched a little bit on the sort of ancient roots of the instrument. Mm. 
the modern roots of the instrument, there seems to be a little bit of controversy from some people. A lot of people wrongly point out the modern version of the buzuki may be, a, may be of Turkish influence. What is the actual modern history of the instrument? This is what I started earlier and I got sidetracked. Okay. So someone asked how the back is made. Mm. It's purely and simple on a Pythagoras, Pyth- Pythagorean um, uh, mathematical equation. Mm-hmm. So is the, the fret. The frets were first put by there by Pythagoras. It's a theorem. Right. where you divide the the distance of the neck by 17.8, which is the medium number, right, okay. which is the golden number. And that gives you the, the frets. And so that's, is, sorry, so that golden number that you're talking about, is this the, is this the thing that... Um, not this, phi. This is, this is not the golden rate. Is this the golden ratio <coughs> No, as well, the golden or? ratio is phi, 1.6. Right, okay. This, this is, is, a, this is okay. a medium for scaled lengths. Right. So even on guitars... So your guitar, your Gibson will be 25 inch, whatever it is. You get that length and you divide it by 17 every single time. And then you get every... So right. it's a Pythag- Pythagoras actually came up with a theorem. Okay. The back of the buzuki is divided into 15, 19 and 21 segments. So fillets. Yep. Okay. And then we get the, exit, it's the 60 fillets, but they're just... They're just you know, cosmetic, yes. Yeah. Mm. But to make that pear-shaped back that we, we use on the bazooka, it's 15, 19 or 21 slithers of timber that will give you that rough uh, pear-shaped um, backing, which again is Pythagoras. It's all right. mathematical. It's very deeply rooted in mathematics. So this is why my argument to a lot of people is that if we have remnants of it with the nine mooses, thousands of years before the Mongols came into the region, mm. how then could it be a Mongol instrument? It can't because it was well known way before that. With the frets, the frets are a very recent idea mm. because the, the tabura and the pandurida used to have movable frets. Okay. Because don't forget, the ancient Greeks used to use, they didn't used to use tone, semitone. They used to use tone, semitone, quarter tone, one sixteenth. Right. They used to have a broader scale of notes. They didn't have just eight notes. They had a broader scale of notes. So it was much more, Greek music was much more involved in tones. It's more that, t- that, we, that we listen to the Turkish music, I suppose, where you've got the yep. quarter tones and the semitones and all that, which is, it, it is influenced with the, you know, the, the, the Far East, but the Far East, again, was colonised by the Greeks many years before yep. that. Mm. Mm. You know, that, that, right. that was a nomadic... So the that Turks were nomadic. in there, what, 11th century? Yeah, yeah. yeah. the, the so Ottoman Empire. Greek. Yeah. Well, <laughs> most of those areas I know very well because my, my father's parents were from there. We go back generations and generations of, you know, nom- not so-called... They weren't nomadic tribes. The Greeks were there established. You know, they had their trade, they had their, you know, oh, from, yeah, from, from, from well Troy, from Troy. Yeah, yeah. that's right. Yeah. So, right. uh, it, so I you, find were you it underneath the Black Sea? Where we're about yeah, to just underneath it? the Black. My grandmother was from Trapezuda, which is mm-hmm. just on the border of the Black Sea, mm-hmm. and grandfather was from the middle of Turkey. Iconio is called. Okay. Mm. Um, obviously, all that was lost, mm. but very wealthy families, mm. uh, very educated, and, and in the arts and music, and all those Greeks were. Mm. Well, it was part of their growing up. Wow, Peter, you're a wealth of knowledge. I think, Tom, that could be another podcast about the Pondians. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. My God. The Pondi- that, that, that's a very talk. touchy subject. It is, uh, but that's okay. It's, we love it. Yeah, you know, uh, it's good to it hear should, it. It should be said. And just going back to, George didn't mention his third and fourth generation. Mm-hmm. I am very, I am absolutely thrilled mm-hmm. that these guys come to my place. Mm. And George has 10, you know, people teaching Buzuki. Mm. George will have 10, Tommy will have 10, Telly will have another 15 and that's all young generation, you know, yep. third and fourth generation yeah. kids that want to learn the Buzuki. That's awesome. Hmm. You know, we, we shouldn't we shouldn't yeah. we shouldn't sidetrack no, look, that. It blows me. and even just hearing that 400 years were occupied. Australia's only what 220 odd years old. 400 years we've been occupied and the culture has not just survived but thrived. Yeah. Now, the next generation, they don't even live in Greece and somehow it's progressing. Yeah, that's an argument, Nick, that, you know, the Greeks outside Greeks always prospered and, and, and brought Greece to its <laughs> heights. Something that has been building up for generations and generations mm-hmm. will not go down that easy, I don't mm, think. We've no. got too many things. Just look at the music. We're talking about music today, yeah? yeah? yeah. We've got Ipirotica. Mm-hmm. We've got Podiaka. We've got, got Kritika. We've got mm. Clarino. We've Love got Clarino. so many different beats. 
and so many different scales and yeah. so many different ways of looking at music. Mm. How can you break that? Yeah. yeah, It's not one type of music. You know, the pentatonic scale, you yeah. play guitar. It's one scale. How many scales do we have, George? Oh, heaps. Yeah. Too, too many to count. <laughs> You know, and derivatives of the single scales. Mm. Yep. So it's, it's amazing. It's just too rich. Mm. So tell us about the, the Greeks now. So we're we up to modern times now. So the Greeks have brought over the bouzouki from Asia Minor. That sort of took it to a new level. The Greeks, I guess it became world the, famous after yeah, that. Well, not really. The, the, um, they, were, they were targeted. The people that brought the bouzouki over to mainland Greece were targeted as um, like the jazz people were, you know. Okay, so they were underground. Bring, they were underground, yeah. yes. Yeah. Because oh, there was okay. a pedigree in Greece, there was a different thought process mm -hmm. because of the influences of the Serbs, of the Ottomans and all that. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't only the Ottomans that we had. We had a lot of other influences coming through Greece. We had mm. the Romans, we had the Venetians and all that. So the people that brought the bouzouki back into, into Greece yeah. were thought as, you know, the underworld. Oh, underworld. Okay. Yeah, they they weren't they weren't they weren't. Um, That's that how right? the baglama was invented, wasn't it? In the zura. Yeah, because they could then put it under their coats, so they could go and Is have, right? a, have a nice meeting like we have now. But they couldn't hold a bouzouki because anyone that would hold a bouzouki was arrested. Mm -hmm. So they made the the baglama. They could put it under their coats, their trench coats, and then go to the houses and then hold a feast. So, wow, uh, they made a smaller version of Fantastic. the bouzouki. What a story! Yeah, well, thank you, George. <laughs> Good on you, George. That's why we brought you brought you both in. <laughs> yeah. Fantastic. Fantastic. That look, that's just and awesome. That's, and that even stories. spurs off a different type of music as well that was invented. Um, so new music was written mm -hmm. um, around what the small baglama, the small zurad, which didn't have the same range of yeah. notes. Mm -hmm that the buzuki had. Um, and the buzuki back then was six strings, right, Peter? Yeah. That's right. Yeah. yeah, so that brings me on to, to that, to the next question. So the tricordo, so well, in, in English, the three string, which is really a six string, versus the tetracordo. What's the distinction? What's the difference? Of Obviously, the, the tricordo is the original, uh, the original version, George. That's right. So um, what's tuned to D, A, D. Um, so what's that in... Uh, re, re, la, re. Re, la, re. That's it. <laughs> in, in, in Greek talk. Um, yeah, so you, you have a, a, an array of songs that are sort of built around, you know, D. As yep. a, you know, D minor, D major... Everything's around D and, and a lot of, you know, obviously you can move things up and down, but you're, you're relying on the drone of your third note because you have to think, as Peter was saying before, you know, they carried the buzukia or the, the types of buzukia, like baglama and the zura, under their coat. So they didn't have the luxury of having big bands. So it was how can you create um, a fuller sound in a room yeah. with only one type of instrument, right? With only three strings or, te, or trichordo, which is, you know, three yeah. chords. Um, and they did this through, you know, DAD. So you, you have some one person playing a bit of a, a tremolo on the D string, on the lower D string, and that's sort of like your bass tone. Yep. Um, and then you have your other musicians that would come in and you do your lead, you do your singing, you'd have someone with a little tambourine that they put in their pocket. Um, and that's how the Rebetika were formed out of, out of the slums when, um, when Buzukia was smashed on the street because yeah. um, they were associated with... Uh, Parties and drugs and having hashish, a good time. The yeah, hashish that's it. dens of, uh, of Bidao. Mm, that's it, yeah. And, and so, so what are some of the names associated with that music? I mean, for me personally, I associate the Tricordo with names like Bambakari. Yeah. Or, you know, n names like that. Who are the big names for, you know, from your perspective? Bambakari, Tsitsanis. Yeah. And if you want to talk about when it came to Tetrachordo, it's um, from Hyotis, wasn't it? That's right. Yeah. He made the, the next, the fourth string. Yeah. He implemented the four string because then he wanted to go into a softer style, yeah. you know, modern style, uh, because it was, they, he saw the future of opening up. Well, it was him and um, Zabeta, really. Zabeta yeah. was, yeah. I studied Zabeta many years ago. Hmm. We, we did uh, a show with, Zab uh, you know, redoing his stuff. I never really appreciated him, hmm. but the stuff that guy wrote in the 50s and 60s. Oh, ahead of its time. Oh, yeah. my God. Yeah. It's even ahead of now. Hmm. There seems to be a clear progression from someone like Bambakari to then Tsitsani and then Hyoti in terms of the way that they colored the, their playing. Is that a fair thing to say? You know, Bambakari sounds, you know, that mangiko sort of sound, you yeah. know, the you know, sound, very, yeah. you know, very simple. Mm. And then Tsitsani comes along and adds, you know, some extra color to it. And then Hyoti comes along and then might, it becomes very... <laughs> might I add uh, what I said too early? Tsitsani was a... Uh, he, he has wrote... He has written some songs that 
for his, you know, his caliber. He I was mean, prolific. Oh my god! Not just in the quality of the songs that he brought that he brought out, but the quantity as well. Over mm. you know how many years? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely unbelievable. What about makers? Obviously, there are some really big names associated with making the buzuki. Mm. The big one that always seems to come come up is Zosef. What yeah. is it about his instruments now? And Zosef, I think, worked with Hyoti, I think, Peter. Is that right? To, to implement the, the extra string? Zosef was an Ar- Armenian. He, he, he knew the art of... I think it passed down through generations. Mm. And he just brought the art to Greece. But he was very mystical. He wouldn't pass on his... Um, yeah. So he kept... I think sometimes when you create a mysticism around something... You know, yeah. people are attracted to it. Yeah. I don't. Uh, even looking at his instruments today, I don't see anything special. That's an interesting point because there's. A, I can't remember who the maker was. Now I was watching an interview with them recently, and they said, "Yeah, Zosef's instruments sounded really good, but realistically, they were made a little bit flimsy." Is that is that fair? I mean, I've, you had one in your in your shop recently when no, I was there. I, I do, but that's the point of the buzuki. It's mm. made flimsy for a certain way. Right. It won't give you if you if you try to correct its geometry you mm. won't get the same sound right so you need to yeah you need to follow the rules mm. and unfortunately you can bend them slightly to make it much more stable because guitars are much more stable in my opinion mm. much more stable i mean you can have a guitar for 30 40 years and nothing will happen to it buzuki not so much uh, because of that dome we have yep. and it's very unstable it's and funny um you say that i went i remember going for a bit of a, a shop in greece a few years ago and um obviously as you do in greece you go to 30 40 different buzuki makers and then you try and find one you that, say that like everyone does it. yeah exactly right <laughs> <laughs> and you, you try and find one that speaks to you in terms of looks in terms of sound in terms of playability in terms of the woods that it's made out of and I remember going to um, Gatsifi in, in Athens. Right. And um, he's obviously a very popular maker. And Absolutely. his buzukia, pretty expensive, pretty premium range of buzukia. And he was telling me that he had one there that I really liked the design of. And I, and I pulled it down and playing, the sound was okay. The playability was very good and it looked amazing. But instead of one sound hole, it had four. So right. it had okay. one main one in the middle and it had lots of small holes around the outside. So kind of like a lute. In some, yeah, in some little respect. bit, um, yeah. like little circular holes, and he was he was telling me this is a Zosef design, okay, and it was one that he used to make a lot of. Um, and going on to your point before, Tom, about like flimsy sort of make, it's exactly what Katsifi said. He goes, "You'll like it for about five minutes, <laughs> <laughs> and it'll be it'll it'll not sound the same in a few years. You'll be angry. You'll bring it back to me. You want me to fix it." Um, and then you'll be sending it back and forth from Australia. You won't right. be happy. Um, however, it's he was. I don't know, Peter. Would you say he was trying to reinvent the buzuki and, and how it looked? And no, no. The first the first guy that actually attempted a harmonic um, holes, they're called, mm. was the guy that I bought my buzuki, and I've still got it today. You, you've seen it. Mm. Um, he was his background was a guitar maker. Oh, okay. So he implemented mm. uh, Zacharias. His name was, which also worked with. Um, Joseph in the olden days. Yeah. So he tried to bring this fancy look out, but it's not it's not about just looking good. It's it's actually I, I've experimented at home with it because I've still got the instrument. You can get some tape and tape the holes, the extra holes in a certain way, and you'll get a totally different sound. Really? Yeah, okay. you do. Wow. Well. You you do. So even guitars, the holes, the the size of the hole, the the way the hole is, all that plays a, a drastic role yeah. on, you know, the back feet of the sound and the air moving through the. Oh yeah, it, give, me, give me a bit of ice there, Nick. <laughs> we're still we're still pouring I'll here. Have so. too, Nick. <laughs> do you want do you want to do you want to top up there? No, no, no I'm fine. Yeah, you're right. Thank you. Okay, so obviously you guys have done a, done a little bit of work with uh, with the buzukia that are that are around right now. Who do you think are the cu- are currently doing really good work in terms of producing producing good instruments? The quality of workmanship. Or the quality of instrument. Good question. I'll leave it to you to to decide which one. Well, George, George. I've, I've ordered a few off a few <laughs> different people. Um, I think lately I've been ordering off um, the Kavala, and I think in Thessaloniki, and he has he has more of an emphasis on the types of woods that he uses. Right. It's, it's less about the the mother of pearl that he puts on there, or his focus. And I've, and I've shown a few to Peter. Is is more about mixing the types of woods i think he's mixed redwood he's mixed cedar he's mixed 
mahogany he's mixed a whole bunch just to create very unique sounds and um and even in his shop he has you know the tall tiled ceilings and mm. just to create that echo so when you go in there and you play the instrument you can hear all the sounds right um i think when chefs talk about adding a bit of spice or a bit yeah. of salt mm. to the food to let it open up it's the same with music you know you have a shop and you have the tall ceilings to let the sound open up and he's his focus is on that. But there's been other makers as well, hasn't there? Is that a pun to me, towards me, George? <laughs> no. You're coming into the garage? <laughs> you got high ceilings in your garage? Yeah, very high. <laughs> Might have to get higher by the sounds of him. <laughs> it's all concrete and echoes. It's nice. Yeah, it's good. <laughs> but um, yeah, there's, there's other makers as well that, that focus on different things. Um, like who's um, Mario Miki, isn't it? The other one? Um, Taksimi makers what, what do they focus on these guys are brilliant i remember tommy bringing me one bazooka it was the first one in australia and he had just found these guys and i said to him i was looking the thing that i do when an instrument comes in i grab the mirror and i always go inside the hole you know to see what yeah, the workmanship right. and i said who are these guys he said to me oh i'm just trialing them out i said these guys aren't bazooka makers are they <laughs> He said, no, how did you know that? I said, well, I can see by the, the reinforcements because these act- these guys, I was right. thinking for many years how to reinforce that bloody bowl, you know what I mean? Yeah. And these guys did it. And I said, this thought process is not a bazooki maker, it's a guitar maker. Yep. Their finishing is absolutely impeccable. Like you can't fault their finishing, their spraying. Initially, the sound wasn't there right. because they were also experimenting. Uh, what are they called? Taksimi, George. Taksimi, uh, I think it's the shop, yeah. yeah. But their, their finishing is impeccable, impeccable. Mm. And, and the way they build their, their, their instruments, especially for Australian conditions, they're f- it's, a, it's an instrument for life. I've said it to many yeah, people. They're very durable. So it sounds like there's something to be learnt by Buzuki players, fr- or Buzuki makers, from the way that guitars are being made. Mm. Is, that, is that a well, fair assessment? This, well, yeah, that's right, George. Um, Tass, they don't leave the realm of what they know because they don't have the time because it's not suitable for them i don't know what the thing is obviously they're trying to make a living yes and this is what they know they're not luthiers yeah a luthier will you know in his spare time will experiment because you can always make a an instrument better Mm. there is no limit you know you can get better timber you can get seasoned timber seasoned meaning you know it's got to be 60 years old right the older the timber the better you know all these old violin makers the stradivari and all that yeah they came up with these odd ways of fashioning and and seasoning their timbers you know i think i remember reading that uh, one of the makers would always put it in urine for some reason the, the top <laughs> for, which was very extraordinary for some you know like he would he would he would soak it for yeah. for a year or something and what's the point of that i don't know <laughs> I, I, like you know they, they, they're still trying to no find out touch it Oh, maybe so, you know I actually remember reading that and I was quite taken makers will go to extraordinary lengths to get this that little bit yeah. you know better than someone else so mm. how long will a buzuki last it depends on how it's built what the timbers if the timbers are seasoned okay. seasoned meaning um, I'm, I'm sorry I get into technical terms no, but this no, is all it. stuff I that it. I learned this is good. Before you make an instrument, the, in, the, the timber has to be seasoned, meaning mm-hmm. it has to sit on the shelf for at least five years. Okay. I so thought you meant salt and pepper, but no. <laughs> seasoned, yeah, yeah, well, <laughs> something like that. Well, yes, it's got to be seasoned be in the many. right way. So, you know, the, 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 the moisture content of the timber has to be right. Mm-hmm. The, even when you start, you, you might have a lump of timber, yes? It's been seasoning for five years. That doesn't mean that timber will be remain stable. Mm. From the moment you'll cut it to create the neck, mm-hmm. it'll you know release different uh, forces and dynamics, and it mm. gets very technical for the eye. Like it's and here's the key thing, right? It's very dynamic because in all the interviews that I've seen with current buzuki makers, they all get asked the same thing: What are the secrets? Some keep those secrets very close to their chest. Others are like, okay, even if I tell people the secrets, it's not like they can just go ahead and do yeah, it. It's no, going to take a certain skill. It's going to take half an hour for me to give you the secrets. It's going to take ten years for you to perfect them, and then a lifetime to figure out what you've done effectively. Because essentially, from what I've learned, there are no secrets. Yeah. Because, as I said earlier, every instrument has its own unique character, 
Yeah. And the timber that you glue together has its own unique character. You don't know that until it's basically finished. Yeah. So you have a rough idea. You go on measurements and, you know, your past experience and all that. Mm. You, you feel the timber and you listen to the timber before you cut it and, and prepare it and all that. But essentially, you cannot put a figure on it. You can probably get close to it, but you'll never get 100%. Yeah. Like, as I said earlier, mm. you can get five instruments. Mm -hmm. The two will be awesome. The three will be mediocre right. know, from the same maker from the same lump of timber yeah. it just it uh, no one can explain what it is is it the way the worker was working at the point in time is it what he exhumed in the timber who knows okay so hypothetically you've built an instrument that is using the best timbers it's they've been seasoned in the in the right way for the right amount of time once you've actually put all of these bits together I mean, the wood doesn't know that you know what you know what this uh, you know the form that it's currently. That's taken. a very good point. How long do you reckon it takes before the instrument actually mellows? Yeah, five years. Right. So you built an instrument, a buzuki. You got to wait five years before it gets to perfection. It's like a wine, isn't it? You got to yeah, wait. Gotta, years. Wait for the wine, wine or the scotch to the, age in a barrel the before you work it out. Yeah, that's a very good yeah. point. That's yeah. a very good point. That's a great point. That's the, the uzo talking. Years. That's the uzo talking, isn't it? <laughs> See how you relax with a little bit of uzo? <laughs> uzo it all comes voice. out, isn't it? <laughs> Here we are. Uzo talk has finally kicked off. <laughs> yeah. We're getting a bit um, serious. It's philosophical. But it's philosophical, mate. Yeah, but it, but but it really it. is because there's yeah, a lot of people as well. There's a lot of people as well. Again, I've, I've, obviously I love the instrument and you know George loves the instrument in a, mm. in a whole other way. Um, there are other people, for example, that have said, makers that have basically said that people come to them and say, look, I really want to buy a, a, a buzuki that I can just loan now that I've retired or whatever the case is. And they want to right the wrongs of the last 20 or 30 years spent sitting behind a desk and they're coming to them to buy an instrument that's going to fix all of those problems. In your opinion, can a buzuki do something like that? It's, it's an interesting point, actually. Um, I've had these conversations with a few students or people that have just come up to me and wanted to order a buzuki from Greece, and they're not sure not sure where to start. It's spiritual to some yeah. to some degree, you know. If you're gonna, but like for me anyway. I mean, other people obviously, mm. pop, you know, walk into a shop and just say, "I want that one. That one, that one looks good." Yeah. I always say to them, "Look, you're picking a buzuki, and you don't know what you're picking. You've never learnt before." You can go to your there's some there are some stores in Greece that yep. and some makers that will almost factory produce a buzuki and give you something that's very cheaply made. I, I won't name any names. I don't want to discredit anyone <laughs> over there because they might you know fly out here and be angry. Um, <laughs> and but, we appreciate your sponsorship too. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, if you want to. The tourist buzuki. That's the tourist, it. There is the tourist buzuki that you find in Plaka or something, you know, and right and. All right, it, it has its merit of being up on a wall in a Greek restaurant and, and showing everyone that, hey, look, we're, we like Greek music. Here we go. But it's for a plinth, but nothing it's for a more. <laughs> you want something that, that has a bit more depth. Um, and I've always, you know, shout out to Le Cavallo in Greece. He, always, he makes a good student buzuki, a good introductory right. level one, one that has those different levels of sound. So one that a student can keep for a few years and they'll notice the change. They'll... As, you, as we said, five mm. years for the mm -hmm. sound to develop. They'll notice as they're learning, the sound will be developing around their play style. If they're very hard on the strings and very hard on the frets, the buzuki will change a little bit, mm. won't they, Peter? According to, to how they're playing it. Mm. Um, and it'll mold around them. And not only that, but the, the depth of the tonality will be very different um, for them. Um, okay, so here's an interesting question for you, right? I've had people come to me saying to me, you know, like, I want to buy a guitar for my kid, you know, wants to learn how to play. And there's always that question of, oh, he's just learning, I'll just buy a cheap one. Hmm. In my opinion, buying the cheapest possible instrument is the worst thing that you could do yeah. for, a, you know, for anyone who's trying to learn one because yeah. it's the worst possible instrument to do anything on. Yeah. You become disillusioned with it. You eventually chuck it in the corner and you're never going to touch it again. Do you agree with that, that sentiment? Yeah. What do you say what, to your students? What I do with my students is I lend them, I always have a buzuki on hand and because you don't know if a student's going to start, they don't know if they're going to continue. They don't know if it's learning an right. instrument is even right for them. So I'll always lend them one of my buzuki I have at home. Mm -hmm. Um, for about two, three, maybe four lessons and just see if they get a feel for it. And then I'll be like, right, I know your play style. I recommend this one. Um, this suits you. And whether they go ahead with it or not, that's another story. But mm. 
that's it's always you need to introduce slowly i think buying the cheapest one and some have come to me with pretty shocking bazooka and i've always just said uh rung up peter and say hey can you have a look and see if we can get the <laughs> strings one out, peter. get the strings to make a noise <laughs> Um, but he's good, but he's not that good. Yeah, we've had a few of those. <laughs> yeah, a few come in <laughs> back a bit of shocking. the queue, Peter. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we've, we've managed to get there. Yeah, but the thing, of- the thing about Peter though is that you know if you want to take your buzuki to him, if you're expecting to, you know for him to say I'm going to have it to you in a week or I'm going to have it to you in a few days, that's not happening, and that's a good thing because, like he said before, he's actually taking the time to learn the instrument, yeah. understand the instrument. And really assess what what needs to be done. Because he'll to play it. it over the course of a week yeah. and and see what the what noises it's making on the high end frets versus the low end frets. Um, you know, tap on the wood to see where it's resonating, and even mm. you know if, if it's got a pickup, plug it in, see how it sounds with it amped up. Look, just sitting back and listening to what you guys talk. I'm in an awe, and even Peter, you mm. just your facial expressions, your hand gestures, you're more, it's not just a job for you, it's just it's passion. No, I, There's I, something I, in you. I don't it's, do this for a job. I, I started out and I say to all the guys that come and visit me, and as Taz said, I will not get you your instrument back to you if I'm not happy with it. First of all, because it's my reputation, and we all know the Greek community is very small. Mm-hmm. And this was my biggest fear when I started out. I said, I said to my wife, imagine someone brings me an instrument that's four thousand or three thousand dollars worth, and then it comes out of here broken. Mm-hmm. Um, they're going to be f- showing, you know. Oh, I won't be able to go to any weddings, or mm-hmm. you know, because they're going to say, "Oh, that guy, you know, ruined my instrument." Yeah, yeah. So there was a there was an element of fear. My character is I always want to strive for the better, mm-hmm. whether it be with instruments, whether yeah. it be my. I'm just. I'm oh, just, I can see it. I'm I'm very s- particular. And I can just see when when George and Tom. Uh, speak and I could just see your passion you know your I could just feel you your hand gestures your facial expressions and your son Dimitri's here as well who's polished off all our olives yeah Zoe yeah Zoe yeah Zoe as well but she can't George's reach the partner. olives unfortunately but um <laughs> But look, I could just see your passion. It's not just a freaking job for you. It's just something that's like your your heritage talking. The ancient gods are talking to you and saying, this is not just a bazook. This is like a, a life. This is our, it is. our I, DNA. I, and it's I a, talk to every instrument, Nick. As, as funny as that may seem, the guys touched on makers in Greece. Everyone can make a bazooki. I feel that it takes somewhat, something special to take that instrument a little bit further, you know, but... To, t- to take that instrument a little bit further, whether it be a bazooki, a guitar, they're all on the same principle. Mm. I don't know if you can tell. I get goosebumps. Every I time can you see speak. that. Yeah, I can see them too. <laughs> is, no, it, is it the uzo? Is it the, the, no, it's, it's you. It's the way you, your passion. <laughs> is, it, is it the uh, It's got to be the uzo, mate. <laughs> oh, maybe. It could be, actually. Um, we're, we're up to Plumati now. So I, I it might will, be the uzo. It's actually I've tasting t- all right now. Yeah, it <laughs> is. I wasn't a fan. I haven't got any top up. We've converted George now. Where is it? I haven't got any of that. You want to top up? Here, mate. Where's the eyes? <laughs> Dimitri, how old are you? 15 now. Okay, 15. I don't he know if you can say it, but he's had a sip. Yeah, he's, right. yeah, he's, he's had he's a taken sip. He's taken after his mum. Yeah. <laughs> this is an illegal podcast. <laughs> no, We're all about peer, peer pressure yeah, as well. Yeah. But you know what? It's funny. It could be another podcast, Tom, but uh, there is Underage no drinking, drinking culture in Greece. You know, we, I think we've talked about <laughs> this. We have spoken about this because yeah, there here, isn't. here it's so taboo, whereas yeah. over in Greece, you know... It's not uncommon for, you know, kids, no, you know, I remember being 14 year olds having sipping wine. I remember okay. being super shocked Normal. seeing a whole bunch of 13, 14 year olds plastered at like the local pub and even in Castellotas. I'm just like, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's just normal. Yeah. <laughs> oh, well. uh, no, dear. it is. Yeah. Yes. No. So, Good boy, Dimitri. I can see Dimitri he's patting his dad. He's, you're, you're very passionate. <laughs> I can see the the next generation of bazooki making is. No, uh, he's, is not, he's, not, he's not in no, there, mate. A player, maybe, Dimitri? He's, what he, do you reckon? No, no, really. Not even. Not really. <laughs> no? Oh, well, mate, you're saying no now, but give it a couple of years, mate. I can just I it. keep telling that, mate. Nick, when I'm not around, he'll regret it. But anyway, what, what are you saying? <laughs> always, always keep an open mind. I think it's important. You always need an instrument to get you in. Like yeah. a gateway instrument. Um, I think I started originally on guitar mm. myself. I did um, I did some aptitude, music aptitude tests and they're like, oh, you should play cello. And I'm like, I don't want to play cello. I'm like, bazooki. <laughs> <laughs> 
Cello, what are we going to do with that? I don't, don't want to play cello. I want to play an instrument that was popular in the hashish dens. But, yeah, that's it. <laughs> but, um, play Titani on cello. That's it. <laughs> my, my music teacher at the time at school, was he was, um, he was a Greek guy. And he's like, how about you play guitar? Because I know that's similar to buzuki. Mm-hmm. I did guitar for six months. And then my parents brought out a cheapy buzuki, which mm-hmm. was probably a, not a great thing, considering what we've been mm-hmm. talking about. Tourist version. <laughs> Tourist yeah. version. But, yeah. you know, it, you just need an instrument to break you into it. Yeah. Um, to open you up to the world of music because yeah. I think music is like a big sort of it's another dimension in a way of thinking it's yes. a, it's another way to to break down problems um, it's, it's one it, of the, the nine intelligent there's yeah. nine different types of intelligence exactly yeah and music is one of them oh, Peter you say that I just <laughs> mentioned the nine muses yeah okay nine muses nine so intelligence is there a connection it could be a course. connection yeah muses museum mm. it's Wanting to learn, and it's all the nine mooses had all the what arts. What do you mean by moose? I think it's of the, mu- the, the animal the muse. muse, the muse, the muse, muse. Okay. the muse. nine sisters okay. that were part of um, trade and uh, not trade, um, music, mm-hmm. culture, and it was okay. part of the Greek mythology. I, I don't want to get into that now. This is one of the things about Peter that you don't know, Nick. Peter is very well, uh, very well versed in uh, Greek mythology and, uh, okay. and history and all that, all Fuck that sort of stuff. Get another Uzo bottle. This is going to be our session. <laughs> I love history. You've Ancient got to be Greek somewhere history. at six. <laughs> oh, you don't want to. You don't. We want will to, go. I, I'm yeah. really good at this too. So we'll. Yeah. Anyway, you, you stick to Buzuki for tonight. You don't want to send me down that path, mate. <laughs> we will. Oh, okay, anyway, we will. Sponsors. Sponsor us, guys, because if you want to hear more about ancient Greece and history, I think we've got the Absolutely. two big plays in the house. Well, look, we've, we've spoken a lot about the, the buzuki itself. Let's talk yes. a little bit about the music. I mean, hmm. w- one of the great players of our times right now, modern players, Manoli Caradini, hmm. recently said in an interview that he feels that there's a conscious movement in Greek music, in Greek popular music, that is, to exclude the buzuki. And, yeah. not ha- and not have it be a part of, uh, of what's currently on radio. And over the last 20 years, I think we can all agree, there's been a bit, probably even more than 20 years, there's been a lot of a Middle Eastern influence, very different sounds to what the original, you know, Rebetica or folk music, you know, sort of sounded like. Do you agree with that to begin with? And where do you think the music's so, going now? There's, a, there's the, the show that he's a big part of, Sinigamas. That's on TV, what is it, six months of the year in Greece? Well, it's, over show. it's over yeah, now. Yeah, they stopped it. Oh, really? Oh, yeah, okay. they have, yeah, unfortunately. They've just oh, cut no. it. Oh. Um, well, Sorry to break it to you. <laughs> that's the first time I'm finding out. Yeah. So, like, Garandinis used to play? Sorry? Garandinis used to play there? Uh, he played in a few of them. Yeah, yeah. He, did a, he did a lot of them. Um, and and his son. But I'm noticing yeah. that I show. Um, it was always a showcase of the best musicians of Greece. They used to mm. come on and, and do a show, do a performance. Um, you know, once upon a time, looking at old episodes from what the early 2000s, late 90s, you have two buzukya mm. up there yep. or three buzukya. Mm. Going as time progresses, it goes down to two, goes down to one. And then instead of buzuki being the lead, it suddenly becomes violin. Um, and you're right, it is starting to sound more Middle Eastern. And I'm noticing a lot of the viewership that they were getting from the show was coming from the Middle right. East. Um, a lot of the Middle East, Middle Eastern people love Greek music, but I think... Greeks, depending on where they could sell records, I guess, were fusing it with Middle Eastern styles. Yeah. Um, so it became more commercial. Yeah, because you, you go back, what, 40 years, 30 years, Greek music mm-hmm. had a definitive style. Yep. Go now, you have Middle Eastern sounding Greek music, you have more European pop sounding mm-hmm. Greek music, you have even Balkan, um, you know, Yugoslav type sounding Greek music. It's even Western. It's yeah. just become more diversified depending on where they can sell the record. So, yeah, I would agree that Buzuki, to an extent, is changing its role inside the Greek band. Whereas mm. once upon a time, the Buzuki used to be the maestro. They used to dictate how the music, as Peter was talking about before, it was the dialogue that would open up to the next song. It would introduce new instruments by doing a bit of a taksimi. It would introduce new songs, new singers. That role, I think, it's not as much of a, a major role of the Buzuki now. Definitely the role is is changing, but... You know, as with a lot of things, and a lot of Greeks and Greece will hate me, that um, unfortunately the old school way of, of organizing bands and, and, and the buzuki is, is kept alive in the diaspora. Yeah. I think a lot of the Greeks around the world still cling to that old school way mm. of, of doing it. And I mean, look at us here. We're talking yeah. about the buzuki and the history of it. And people contact me and they want to learn the old school way of doing buzuki. And they're mm. like, we can't find any new concerts. We can't find any new remakes of old songs new um yeah. you know modernizations of old songs 
And I'm like, well, it's all in you. You've, we've got a band together. We've got to do it. And yeah. it's not like for a lack of want. I think it's a highly commercialized yeah. version of music that has taken over. With As with Western music, I think. I know a lot of people may disagree. A lot of people agree with me. I know a lot of people in the Western sort mm. of English music scene have said that, you know, mainstream bands, um, a lot of the music now in, in Australia, the top 40, they're very overproduced. Um, oh, yeah. They spend too much time focusing on electronic sounds to come out of the synths rather than, you like know... Live music, live bands. Yeah, it's, it's you know, can we make this sound, whether we should make this sound. Um, you know, it's... It's like artificial, it's like yeah, food. Yeah, it is, there's yeah. There's no soul. There's no there's, soul, there's no soul to it, no. Yeah. But Buzuki are still big in Greece, aren't they? I'm sure they are. Buzuki's oh, yeah. still big. A lot of lot of kids learn Buzuki because, as I was saying, it's... Even the Buzuki are in yeah. Greece. The, the Buzuki are still popular. Oh, yeah. yeah. It's huge. And, and just to add to that, the best thing that can happen for Buzuki at this point in, in time in Greece mm-hmm. is it for, it's for it to go underground. Mm. Yeah, because that's okay. where it's going to be re- yeah. re- regenerated. Yeah. Oh, it's one thing and I love about Athens. You know, you can go to an underground bar and you've got this classic bazooki player. Yeah. And the fingers are going 100 miles an hour and he's looking mm. at the crowd, winking at everyone. And <laughs> yeah. Typical Greek. That's, that's and what you it's know become. What? Yeah. You know what? That's the interesting thing as well. Like when we go to Greece, okay, yeah, you can go to the bazooki and you can go and watch, for example, Remo. You know, and he's got someone like Nicolopoulos with him or, or something mm. like that, which is you know, I was fortunate enough to see a few years ago. But by and large, when we're going over there, we're always looking for that small joint yeah. somewhere yeah. Yeah. that's always got a couple of blokes sitting in a corner. Yeah, They're, they're not even plugged in. <laughs> <They're> just, <laughs> it's just two blokes sitting there playing acoustic and they're playing old school songs. Yeah, What do you think it is about that? What is it in us? It's unique. That makes us look for that. It's soul. Yeah, it is. It's soul. It's unique. It's something that speaks to us that we don't get in many other cultures. There are mm. some cultures that do do it, but that sort of dive bar sort of scenario where yeah. you have mm. a musician in the corner that's that's pouring his soul, heart and soul out into an mm. instrument. Is that how Sticky started out? I heard a yeah. story about Sticky in Newtown. Mm. There's a couple of boys... Went to, I think it was New South Wales Uni, mm. and all their mates would come over, and their, their, their mum would, you know, feed all the all the, the guests. Yeah, guess, good old, good old to their Paul. Music. Yeah, Paul that's it. Stecky, yep. yeah, yeah, good old Paul. We should do a podcast there, Tom. Yeah, well, Paul, if you're yeah. listening, we'll uh, we'll bring you in, mate. <laughs> Definitely. So that's how it started. So yeah. all the boys would jam in there with their bazooka. Mm. Uh, local residents would listen in and go, how fantastic is this? And the, yeah. the mums would cook food. Eh? Meze, thank you for the boys are listening. and. Yeah. Moved it indoors and it's been going on for what? That's 20, what it should be. Years. At the end of the day, that's what it should. It should be. You There's know, nothing a very better relaxed than relaxed way yeah. of playing music. Music should always be to yeah. enhance the sun. Like a bit like you drink a bit of alcohol, a bit of uzo <laughs> with your. But food. I've had amazing nights of sticky. Yeah. And half the time I'm mesmerised looking at the bazooki player. And mm. again, I'm not musically minded like you three are in here. <laughs> I'm a, I'm a novice to you guys. Listen to you guys talk. I'm just mesmer. I'm sitting here, sitting back drinking ouzo and it's not getting boring, is it? <laughs> no, not at all. I'm actually like I said, I'm getting goosebumps, and it's not the ouzo. It's yeah. just your talk. But your guys, passion. nothing's changed. Nothing has changed in the last five thousand years. Greeks will always be the same. Mm. They will always find a hole somewhere to try and touch their soul, whether yep. it be through music, whether it be through dialogue, whether it be through you know philosophy yeah. whether it be through fighting with one another that's the beauty of the human race mm. if we don't do not come together in dialogue and and not so much fight but oppose each other you don't get any better you won't get any better you, you, you mate. you'll stay Look, stagnant there's greeks in freaking boston toronto new york you name it and uh they're all listening they'll, i'm sure they'll be listening to this and they'll be commenting and they can relate to it again you can take the as they say, the old saying, you can take Greeks out of Greece, but you can't take the Greek out of a Greek, you know, mm. no matter where you are. And, you know, George, you're a perfect example. Your great-grandparents were born in Greece. That's right, yeah. You're so many generations away from, you know, Greece, and somehow you're more passionate than, I don't know, sometimes me and Tom I could see. <laughs> I feel like you're more passionate than me sometimes. I think it comes in waves of generation to generation. I think some generations yeah. oh, are very passionate, it. some are less so. But it's always, yeah. you're right, it is always yeah. there. Yeah, It is. And Dimitri, he's sitting here listening to his dad. He's patting his dad. He's proud of his dad. Listening <laughs> he's to got no story. choice, mate. <laughs> <laughs> mate, oh, I love it. It's what's, good. What's the process of indoctrination for your kids, uh, Peter? Is there, was, there, was there a plan for, for making making them proud of their Greek heritage? I always said to my... Because early on, we had a lot of problems conceiving, having children. 
and I said to my wife early on in the piece, I said, look, if it's not going to happen, if it's not meant to happen, because I'm a, I think outside the box. If, it's, <laughs> if, if nature's saying, no, it's not going to happen, don't push it. Yeah. But eventually it happened. But my thought process is if I've had these bloody mongrels, I'm going to at least leave <laughs> two Greek... Dimitri Sheik in his yeah, head. <laughs> yeah. Like Dimitri, I've got uh, Dimitri, a boy in Fotini, a girl, 10, no, 15 and uh, 11. What is there for me to, to leave when I leave this planet? They're my legacy. Yeah. I may be wrong. I come with a lot of knowledge and a, lot of, and, and a past and history. The least I can do is pass it on to them. Whether right. they pass it on, you know, to their... It, it's, it's their doing, but... Mm. You well, know, just having Dimitri here... It d- doesn't look like he was forced to come here, mm. just listening to you. I was forced. Really? <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, 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 no. Listen, <laughs> listeners out there, I don't think so. The way he's <laughs> patting his dad, he's proud he's of proud his of dad. Uh, look, it's just actually nearly bringing a tear to my eye, watching how proud you are of your dad, listening to his stories. Look, it's just, honestly, it's, it touches you sometimes hearing that. We, have to, we have to all do a, This is how Hellenism survived. Yeah, but you're not even doing anything. You're just... You're being yourself. You, know, you learned that from your daddy, granddad. You're not forcing your kid here. He's just coming here on his own will, I think. Yeah, and he's I hope listening. So. And he's, I hope so. And I'm telling you now, I reckon we're looking at the next best bazooki maker in Greece, possibly. What do you reckon? <laughs> Certainly in Australia. Eh? It Definitely could be. in Australia. <laughs> now, the knowledge he's had from his dad. You blow me away with all the detail you went into. Oh, my God. It's, and and yeah. again, you're just touching the surface. Of I am. I am. The knowledge of what you know. So Only because I was open to it. You've mm. got to be open to the fact that a buzuki, you know, George grabs his buzuki, he will see it in a different way. I mm. wanted to take it 10 steps further. Why is it that this lump of timber put your, the hairs on your arm mm. up? What is it that makes it? What is it that does that? You know, and then tweak it a little bit more, and tweak it a little bit more, and and just. But that's my nature. That's my mm. character. Whether I'm, you know, trying to repair oh, it's your, an instrument. your paradigm. You don't know why you're like that. No, it's just your paradigm. No. I'm, I'm like that. It's Nick. Your DNA. I'm, it's your yeah, ancestors yeah, talking to you. You I don't, don't even I don't know, know why who it like was. That. I don't know who it genetic was. Genetic memory. Yeah. 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 Genetic I'm like memory. that as well. You know, mm. I was born and bred in Australia. We we grew up, you know, playing rugby league, body surfing, you know, surfing, all that sort of stuff. Had no connection, I guess, yeah. to Greece initially. I did have a connection, but however, I felt like I was not lost, but trying to find myself. Actually, I've got a funny story. I, I was going to say yeah, it yeah. earlier, but then yeah. here we go. It's the, yeah, it's, it's the Uzo that just reminded me. <laughs> mm-hmm. I'm getting a bit more relaxed now. Sorry, George, I'm taking the... Uh, George, no, kicked, <laughs> the, George the, kicked Buzuki yeah. already, mate. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's it. You're going to um, kick in after this story. So I went to see my wholesaler, and I had this old-timer Greek guy brought mm-hmm. me this flamingo guitar mm-hmm. okay now the structure of flamingo guitar as tas would know mm. is totally different to an acoustic guitar anyway okay. the way it's built you can't change many things okay and over time this action got really high and as you know the flamingo guitars are built around the neck they're not you, the body's not with the neck anyway mm-hmm. so i'm getting a very bit technical but anyway that's not the point <laughs> get technical we love yeah. it okay so and he left it he left it there and i said to him vasily i said you know what? I said to him, just leave it with me and I'll think about it. And when he left, okay, I was, uh, at night I was waking up, I'm like, how the hell am I going to get these strings to lower? <laughs> like, honestly, how am I going to do it? Anyway. Have a sleepless night fixing your I house. did. I Thank honestly you. did. And it was quite early in the piece and I was a bit hesitant, you know. You know, when you're starting out, you're a bit yeah. hesitant. Anyway, so I'm thinking of this bloody thing. I can't take the neck off the body and how am I going to do it? How am I going to change the angle? One night in the middle of the night, three o'clock, I had a eureka moment. Mm-hmm. I said, why don't you take the fretboard off and change the neck of the, the, the angle of the neck? How? By putting a le- an added piece in there. What's the worst that can happen? I'll just ruin his <laughs> instrument. You know? <laughs> what could happen? Anyway. It's the, the Greek gods talking to you there. Anyway, Greek it, philosopher. Something like that. Anyway. So I go to my wholesale and I said to him, Daryl, I said, I'm just going to ask you for something. Just give it to me. Don't ask me what it's for. I'm just trialing something. So he said to me, all right, what do you want, Pete? He said, I, I said, I want a bit of rosewood because it's rosewood is used for necks. Mm-hmm. It's a hardwood, but it's a stable wood. But I said to him, I don't want you to cut it out on the dimensions of an acoustic guitar. I want you to wedge it. Mm-hmm. So I want you to start from zero and then go to f- three mils. 
So he's looking at me and he said, okay. So he went through his pile of timber and by that time I had taken the fretboard off this bloody guitar and I'm looking at it. So you're committed to it. I'm committed to it. Like, (laughs) how am I going to change this angle anyway? (laughs) And and Daryl's on the machine and he's looking at me and he's saying, the hell do you want this wedge for? Like, what are you doing? I said, you know, it was pretty early in the piece. I didn't want to say, he was, he's an expert guitar maker. Right. Anyway, I said, Daryl, just how much is it? And he said, 20 bucks. I said, <laughs> but he goes, before I give you the wedge, I need you to tell me why you need this wedge. I said, Daryl, please don't do this to me. Uh. He said, no, no, I'm not going to give it to you. I said, Daryl, look, I've got an acoustic guitar. I can't change the angle of the neck from the body to lower these bloody strings. And so I said to him, I'm going to put this, I've taken the fretboard off. And I'm going to put a wedge under the fretboard and angle the fretboard on a different angle. He said to me, who told you how to do that? Hmm. I said, I don't know, mate. I had a eureka moment at three o'clock in the morning. Hmm. He said, do you know that is the way they do it in Spain? Is that right? That's the way they do it. Wow. Espanol. I got, I got the upper hand. I said, okay, or well, I'm not going to make a fool of myself. <laughs> or like he goes, pasa. how the hell did you think of that? I said, Daryl. Let me tell you one thing, mate. I said, my ancestors were building the Parthenon 2,000 years ago. This is nothing for me. Is this Daryl Kerrigan from the castle? I said to him, just give me the bloody thing and leave me alone. I'll fix it. I said, the Parthenon, mate. We were building the Parthenon 2,000 years ago. The guitar's nothing to me anyway. So I went away and I was scratching my head. I go, oh, I got out of that one. My big fat Greek wedding. My ancestors had cholesterol when you guys started cooking meat. That's exactly right. Yeah, that was a funny moment. Great story. George, listen, enough talk of Buzuki. I know you guys are right into it. Yeah. I want to hear something. Let's play the the Greek Stairway to Heaven. You want the Greek Stairway All right. to Heaven? Yeah, you? can you play the Greek Stairway to Heaven? <laughs> oh, I love it. Here we go. Oh my God. I'm going to get up. Get up, Dimitri. Amazing what a lump of wood can do, eh? Absolutely. Peter, look. <laughs> I didn't do anything, mate. He played. <laughs> Fucking hell. Goosebumps. Boys. Yeah, absolutely. And ladies and gentlemen, goosebumps. That was fantastic, George. Awesome. And listen, we've got Zoe here. Sorry, Zoe. That's it. Well, we've got to bring you in here. Okay, you're here. You're listening to us fucking gibber along and talk crap and listen to your man play the bazooki. Tell us, how, the, how did you see that? Did you enjoy that piece? Of course. Of course. <laughs> are you proud when you see him play, playing uh, playing all these gigs? What do you feel for him? Well, of course, because you can just feel the soul coming out, which is the whole point of the bazooki, and it's really an extension when any bazooki player plays, extension of their soul and their expression. But um, back to the whole discussion about the gateway instrument, which I think is interesting to add. Mm-hmm. I played violin. Wow. And my okay. mother, you from Crete? I, I wanted to play guitar, right? <laughs> so, but my mother said, mm, no, you should play violin because it'll make you smarter. It didn't give me that whole, I think, sustainability of passion mm-hmm. for being a musician myself. Mm-hmm. Um, so I obviously love listening to music, but it's more art. But when George and I were talking about my kind of experiences in terms of this, uh, learning violin... Mm-hmm. It's interesting because I had a classical background. I learned from a Russian violin teacher and even understanding the difference in terms of learning buzuki Mm -hmm. because George didn't learn it from music, whereas 
from a classical musician. He had the George method. <laughs> well, I, I don't know whoever okay, so his it wasn't teacher was. Freestyle. Yeah, freestyle. Wasn't freestyle. Freestyle. I think that's it was an just imp- yeah, and that's an important tea. distinction, I think, in terms of understanding the bouzouki itself, mm-hmm. and it's kind of off script. Mm. You learn it from the listening, okay. as opposed to any classical musician mm-hmm. and classical background, which is more academic mm. and following instruction. Yeah, so that's so I think point. that's the point. That's yeah. why Buzuki is so soulful mm. because it's completely, it's all felt. And I, I can relate to that approach because I mean, my, like you guys know, my yeah. background's from, from Corfu, which is a very musical island. Um, I wouldn't know the first thing about reading a note. Mm. <laughs> everything that I've learned and everything that I do is all by ear, whether it was the guitar or the buzuki or whatever the case is. What it comes down to is what's inside you, mm. you know. And if you've got it inside you, and if you're inspired by the instrument, or if you're inspired by what the, mm. um, by what it does to other people in particular as well, that's the gateway mm. for you know for people to play. And and it, and it changes. I, I found myself playing, you know, studying, trying to do something on the buzuki, and then. I'll just put it aside and say, no, it's not working. And then I'll pick it up and half an hour later and it's all flowing. Mm. So it's, it's unexplained. Like it, it's something you can't explain. Yeah. No, look, you make it perfect sense. It's like, it's the academic way you're, you're memorizing your, 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 you're reading something that that's been written compared to the way it feels. Mm. It's, it's the flow of it. There's a definitely a, a very clear differentiation of, yeah. Being an academic, yeah, definitely. You, you, you're memorising and you're reading something compared to the feeling of using your other senses. It's, it's actually blown me away. Again, I'm getting more fucking goosebumps. This <laughs> it's got to be the... It's, well, which one are you drinking now? I can't even this see is, anymore. This is the oh, that's nice, that Wait, is that the, is that the fresh bottle that, that was, was full that, that about was the half fresh an hour bottle. ago? <laughs> that <laughs> was the fresh bottle. That's nearly gone. <laughs> Well, since so, um, <laughs> Zo- <laughs> since Zoiza actual uh, as a musician, we should ask her her heritage as well. That's very important because that's a good question. Let, let Great me, question. Let, let well, me, she's um, one of the six. Like I said, it was me and Tom. Two, we gone to six. We heard from the mid. Yeah. Zoe, so let's. What's your background? Let me just point out something <laughs> that for the ancient Greeks, the woman was the head of the house. Yes. And what's changed? Wasn't no, no. Hang on. Wasn't yeah, well, she the neck? She controls. She the was head? the heart, mate. <laughs> she was the heart and the soul. You don't mess with the Greek woman. Hey? You don't mess with the Greek no, woman. No, that's right. No. Exactly right. So, Zoe, what's your heritage? <laughs> Catherian. So, you know, very good friends Ooh. with the Kazis. <laughs> <laughs> well, the first Greeks in Australia, I believe. Yeah. Catherians and the Kazis. Yeah. So, um, my grandparents were born, all born in Kithira and mm-hmm. they were the ones who moved um, at different times. Mm-hmm. And then they all met in Australia. Yeah. They did, in their separate ways, plan to move back to Greece mm-hmm. um, when my gran- when my parents were born. For some reason, they just came back to Australia. They believed that you know you you make a living in Australia and then and you make your money in Australia and you go back to Greece and spend it. That's what all of them all of said them. in yeah. the beginning. Yep. My grandparents said exactly the same thing, and all of the the siblings that came along with them. We're going there for a short time, we're making money, and we're going back. And mm. none of them did. But they go back. Yep. <laughs> Very few people go back. I think it's the ones that have got the guts to actually make that change and take the step. Because we, in Australia, yes, we get very comfortable. It's, it's, an easy, it's an easy lifestyle, full of opportunities. But like Nick said earlier, it's quite a young country, yep. uh, especially in the 70s and 80s. There were a lot of opportunities. And, and okay. socially, socially and structurally, the country was still not as diverse. So there were opportunities, mm-hmm. you know, there to, to be taken. And, and, you know, I'm not just talking about the Greeks. I'm talking mm-hmm. about all the Mediterranean cultures. All cultures. It would have been challenging early, in the early piece. Well, but, but they were so much, so versed in, in, the, in the way of life and, and the hardships they had when, you know, if, if you're living in... 1940 mm-hmm. or the 20s in in Europe anyway I'm not just talking about Greece and coming to a, a country like Australia where you know you can just open up milk bar and and mm. you know cuts thousands of dollars and give you that power of you know the monetary buying power mm. that's what created I think that's what created Australia mm. yeah, Australia yeah. was born 2200 years ago but Australia really is only 50 60 years old mm. you know I oh, look 
you know, if you look at our indigenous heritage, it's been yeah, sixty thousand years. Yeah, of course. But I'm saying the modern but Australia, the modern, modern yeah, yeah, the, yeah, the, 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 the modern social economic mm. structure of Australia is only really sixty years old. Yeah, you know? it was done by the the migrants. Mm. You know, the migrants inputted a lot. Well, we we excelled. I guess it all started from I think it was the Second World War where Australia nearly got invaded by Japan and. I said we only had like a, a few million to protect the country. So it was a more it was a case of populate or perish. I think was the um was the, the quote Cot- the Curtin yeah. government that uh, after mm-hmm. after World War Two, yeah. and that's what actually brought about that wave of migration that brought, for that's example, right. my grandparents yeah. over. You know, well, it started with the English first, and then they they went through Yugoslavia, Italy, Greece, and they all came mm-hmm. in the fifties straight yeah. after World War Two. Yeah. You know, early fifties, sixties, and. So forth. That's it. Because we need. Is that when your family came, Peter? In the '64. Uh, right. Yeah. Okay. We were called communists because even though my grandfather was fighting to for the oppressors, whether yeah. it be the Germans, the Italians, or whoever it was, these people were then deemed communists. You know, they were persecuted, and, and not only from Greece, from uh, you know all all parts of the world, but predominantly for the Mediterranean. You know, they, they was, these were the hardworking people, and. They wanted to do something mm. for themselves and they had the opportunity. So the opportunities were given in Australia at that point in time. It's, it's interesting. I was listening to another podcast the other day and they were talking about how sometimes in the, the most rep- repressed cultures of a society spurs the, the most beautiful music and the yeah. most beautiful art and culture and, and the subcultures. Yeah. Um, you know, you have the best books that are written in, in as from repressed cultures. You mm-hmm. have, you know, the best music and, and that's why we get the Rebetica, right? Yep. It was a repressed people. It's the blues of Greece. It's the blues yeah. of Greece. And and um yeah, I'm, I'm even noticing um, you know, to an extent, um, you know, I, I think it's exactly the same, but you know, in some lockdown peoples there's <laughs> there's some uh, there's some new cultures that are forming, there's some mm. new types of music. I'm even seeing other countries adopt buzuki. Um, I'm seeing really? a big spur of buzuki in Israel. Israel. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, it's really taking off. And they're, they're doing old school rebetical music. Uh, even if you go back to when rebetical started um, in Athens and Thessaloniki. Thessaloniki as a city in the 30s before you know Nazi occupation, there was a very large portion of Jewish population there and it's i think it goes as far as to say that abetico did go hand in hand with a lot of the the jewish and greek jewish yeah. blues back in the day so yeah interesting yeah. interesting bit of history and we're we seem to be repeating it <laughs> a little bit now we're having a bit of a revival of it yeah this, this is why good. i said earlier that i'm not worried about I, i'm sad that they've been trying for many years to get the buzuki off the the, the music scene in greece but i'm yeah. not worried about it the, the harder they try, the better. Yeah. Because then it'll just go underground. And once you get well, stuff underground... You have new stuff written. The sky's and, the yeah. limit. There's well, nothing that, like that an was underground be, Yeah. Well, that, that was going to be my, my next question, really. Well, let's not what? diverse from uh, Zoe. I mean, we've still got <laughs> things to ask her. I mean, we, we cut her in half. What did you want? What did uh, you want? Uh, <laughs> poor Zoe. She only thought yeah. she was going to come in and drop off No, no, no. We should. Uh, she's a musician as well. Why? Yeah, I didn't know. I thought she just came in to drop off George. Designated driver. That's going to be the star of the show. So, line up fellas yes <laughs> questions to Zoe. I mean. so the violin is that what it is? is that a it's a cretin instrument isn't it or should we go into that detail well it diverted from the litter the pondian litter and then, the, and then Every, the everything started in yeah, greece yeah, yeah. everything started in greece <laughs> um, i think well uh yeah so with the violin there we go i'm just there getting used to the, the microphone <laughs> Um, I think another key point is for me, even though I'm not a mu- like practicing playing music mm-hmm. um, as I did with the violin, mm-hmm. I think dancing is a key important with oh, here we go. music. Yeah. So especially the bazooki. So another level. That's another podcast. So, yeah. Yeah, and for me, when I listen to Greek music, it's mm-hmm. not just about listening to it; it's also about getting on the dance floor and dancing along to it. Such a great and, point. And that is what also gives the musicians at Stecky mm. more life when they're playing. Yeah. So, yeah, d- no, great dancing you. is like... I'm not a renowned no. dancer, but I've been to Stecky. And honestly, when you hear that Pozuki play and start singing, it's like everything around you just disappears. It's a it's trance. Like, it is a trance. It's just you and the music. And 
No, you don't care who's looking at you, who's around. I, I, I hear you, exactly. And I had my Aussie mates come with me as well. <laughs> uh, back in the day, we had a, one of our functions. We, we ended up up there somehow. And, uh, and even they're doing the Zimbekigo dance and they got no idea. And I said, guys, it's not about who's looking at you or what moves you can do to impress people. It's just you and the music and that's it. It's like a, it's yeah. a soul experience, you know. It's how hard is it, Tom, you know, yeah. as a guitar player, how yeah. hard is it when you're playing and no one's dancing? I mean, I've played to a lot of empty rooms in my life. How <laughs> hard is it? Yeah, look. How it, sterile it, is it? It is, it, yeah, it's it's pretty hard because, you know, as a musician, you know, any musician of, of any level, if you're playing in front of people, you learn very early on that you feed off the energy of the, of the audience. 100%. If the audience is giving you good vibes, that's coming into your into your body, into your soul, and you're channeling it out through your instrument again. The better that vibe is, the better the overall experience and the better the night becomes. If there's nothing happening... It depends you, where you, you are. Know. It's like a sticky, honestly. You're yeah, in a yeah. trance. Everyone just gets up. Yeah. Even me, I'm not a dancer. Yeah. I don't get up and dance. Yeah. It's sticky. I'm not Somehow, either. I just get dragged up. That's Because yeah. what music is, it's energy, it's sound waves. Yeah, mm. that's a good point. So, and that's what's the language really and okay. that's what the soul that's what is. draws you, you know, and that's positive what's energy. then also channeled through dance because that's also channeling the energy too mm. which is why it's that great point this, i understand what you're saying it's another language it is when you got that positive energy people who like me who aren't into dancing somehow get dragged up all of a sudden my hands are spread out left and right my <laughs> eyes are closed i'm <laughs> slapping the floor slapping the my heels of my you shoes you sure it's not the scotch <laughs> It's definitely. It, it the could be. It could be actually. It's it's another. It's a debate. Which is a point that it's a very good point that Zoe says. Which is well, I come back to my initial um, explanation of dialogue. The word dialogue. It the comes logos. from dialogos, which means logos to dia. Mm. Who was dia? No idea. Who was Zeus? Yeah. Oh, okay. So I get very it. Wow. important word. Mm. This is why the Greeks need dialogue and all human beings we're a social being mm. that's and a whether, very good point and then whether you bring it through music dance mm. philosophy whatever mm. you need dialogue this is what yeah, this is the beauty people. it's it's anyone can relate to it that's a thing it's not just greeks it's humans that's can exactly relate right. to what you're saying it's the folk culture i think because every culture mm -hmm. has their own folk history Folklore. and yeah. all, and i think the beauty in Buzuki is it stayed folk, right? It hasn't really been commercialized yeah. as such, as opposed to some other elements. And as much as they try and commercialize it, somehow it all defaults back yeah. to the history and the culture. Which is probably what's happening now, mm. you know, on its own accord. It's taking its own course. So I don't like that. I don't want to be commercialized. <laughs> so I'll go underground again and I'll come back in 20 years. You know, mm. that's great. The true but it's spirit there. <laughs> yeah. It's written in our DNA, but yeah. Mm. It's, it's, it's funny. I yeah. am absolutely thrilled that I see people like George mm. and the younger generation guys that play Muzuki have students. Mm -hmm. I say to them all the time, I am so happy for you. Yeah. I am so happy for the Greek community. Mm. You know, I, I, what I do, I don't do for, you know, to show myself. I didn't enter this repairing because i wanted to it's a monopoly it's not yeah. a monopoly i wanted to reach out to people i wanted to give people that opportunity to mm. you know but that's what it is that's why you're good at it peter that's what i it don't is. know if i'm good at you're it not, you're it's not doing it you you're are. good at it you are <laughs> again I, I don't know if i'm good you're at very it. modest because you always i feel like you're the person that looks like is always trying to improve like you never call yourself a perfectionist you're always looking trying to improve make things better but that's but, what makes you good but isn't the sky the limit nick of course. So uh, there is no limit. That, 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 that implies to instrument repairs. That implies to dancing. That yeah. implies to like whatever we do. Just take it to the next level. It's not really just two take it two push dimensional. It, push it. Push it. Yeah, maybe we'll see it two dimensional. Okay, that piece goes there, but it's not about that when, when I hear you speak. You know. and, and you know what the greatest satisfaction is? When I actually repair that instrument mm -hmm. and then I get the owner of the instrument to strum that first strum. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And say, wow, I didn't expect that. That is my biggest appreciation. It's mm. not monetary. It's not, yeah. you know, I did this. It's yeah. that appreciation yeah, of yeah. the smile on their face yeah. and the appreciation of, wow, is this my instrument? Yeah. Yeah. And I can tell you firsthand that that feeling was just unbelievable. 
you know, after Peter had, you know, gone through my... It's my not Peter. Gift. It's not Peter, Taz. Yeah. It's some median. I'm a median yeah. that I'm helping you out. Yeah. It's the median. It's, it's not the Peter. Muse. It's the muse at the end That's of the That's exactly day. right. Yeah, because yeah. through me repairing your instrument, I've learned. Mm. And then for you to contact me, you've learned. Yeah. Mm. But the, the appreciation on your face mm. is what came out through my hands. Yeah. That's what I see. Mm. I don't see the money that you throw on the table, yeah. as you've noticed. <laughs> Whoever comes to me, I never grab the money off yeah. your hands. Yes? It's always thrown 100%. in the side of the corner because yeah. I don't do it for the money. Yep. Yeah. It's the appreciation that, mm. you know, I've done this. I've, yeah, I've yeah. made someone happy. I've made... That's what it is. When you're passionate about something... Is it passion? I don't know what it is. Nick. I think it is. DNA. I think, I think it, it is I get passion, passion's man. very uh, a loose term, but I think it's a bit more. They're very deep. It's a very deep yeah, understanding that, that's, of... That's my problem. Music. Well, look, I but think... That's, that's not a problem, mate. That's yeah. an asset. <laughs> oh, my God. Like, if you well, can connect yourself with your ancestors... I'll ring you up at 2 way. o'clock in the morning <laughs> when I've got thoughts going through my head and I can't solve them. <laughs> Well, no, look, I know. will be at the bazooka by then, so yeah. they definitely ring us. <laughs> well, Peter, you didn't do this because you wanted to advertise your business or anything, because you don't need the advertising, really. But if someone does need to get in touch with you, is there is there a way that you prefer to? They can contact them? you. Fantastic. Well, if if anyone needs uh, to get Uzo in contact talk. with Peter, com. what's that? Uh, Uzo, Uzo talk at outlook dot com. So just uh, yeah. just send us an email. Um, I think that kind of brings us full circle, and I think um, we got a Facebook. No, we yet. haven't. We haven't let Zoe oh. finish. <laughs> <laughs> this podcast's going to go into the, next week. That's very rude of us. <laughs> Actually, before we get on to the next bit, what's yeah. our Facebook page? Do we have our one? Facebook page is starting up, and it's uh, the, our handle is at Uzo Talk. Mm-hmm. Um, so just look that up on uh, on Facebook, and uh, you'll find all manner of interesting things. I'm sure. Perfect. Uh, and we'll post some photos too. I can see you're clicking away. Absolutely. Yep. We've got a whole a, bunch of stuff oh, happening. George and yeah. Peter on here, and that's okay. Look, it's not about what you look like. It's, it's your soul talking through the photos. That's it. That soul is going to kill us. <laughs> it's all about soul. <laughs> no way, mate. So, Very ne- I never asked you, Nick. Do you have a family? Do you have kids? Do you yes, do? I do. Can't you see the photos over there? They're my boys. Wow. There are, uh, yeah, there. I think you can see the photos of them doing uh, nippers down at uh, Wanda, Cronulla Beach. Yeah, there are uh, one's seventeen, one's fifteen. Yeah, they're they're right into their sport, water polo. Yeah, uh, and, lo- and life's and great. The, and the mum is genuine DNA Greek or not? She is. Yeah, that's yeah. good. Awesome. She's, she's an Islander. Look, she's not a mainlander like us. <laughs> Look, mainlanders. She's an Aboriginal. She's no, fine. she's an Islander. They sit around. Yeah, and that's they, fine. They, that's they fine. fish all day. But yeah, that's fine. <laughs> us, us mainlanders. She's, Zoe's an islander. I'm sure most don't, of you. Don't knock I'm the an islanders, an islander mate. Well. I think you're he's all an, islanders. An, no, not me. I'm an islander. I'm a, I'm a mainland. <laughs> mate, you islanders sit around, fish all day. Us <laughs> mainland guys, we yeah. hunt, we hunt wild That's it. animal with our bare hands, mate. <laughs> we're, we're the men in the mountains. We hunt but, wild but fish. <laughs> you, you, you know what my argument is? These people yeah. that want to go close to the water. I said Darwin said that we came out of the water, and you want to go close to the water. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I said, no, nah, mate. I said, mountains. Yeah. <laughs> mountains. The higher I can go, the better. Yeah. Oh, beautiful. Dear. Where, that's where we're from. But the beauty is we're from the mountains where it meets the water. It's amazing. We've got yeah. best of both worlds. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> my, it's amazing. My, my wife's village, I dare say, I'll put a bit of a personal twist to it. <laughs> when I first met her, I said, I went down to her Horyo and I said, what the hell are you bringing me here for? Like, you know, like honestly, the, this is a goat it's town. <laughs> <laughs> like, you know, the bloody car doesn't even go in there. Well, what, what the hell are you doing here? Like, let's get out of here. Because we, we settled in the north of Greece, yes? Yep. We came from Asia Minor we, and the north of Greece is very plentiful. Thessaloniki, we're about. Uh, Edessa. Yeah, the right. So we have Utica. a lot of water and mm-hmm. waterfalls and it's very plentiful mm. and the soil is very, mm-hmm. you know. Anyway, and I went to this place and I met this girl and it was rocks and rocks <laughs> and rocks. <laughs> anyway, and I said, what the hell am I doing here? Anyway, but in time, my friend, yeah. I let go of my, the northern part of Greece and I've fallen in love with the southern part of Greece. Beautiful. Wow. Did they have that Gladino up there? I don't know what they've got. <laughs> The wind is We're all Highlanders, you know that. But but the mountain. We've got the Greek kilt. Yeah. The Highlander music. Yep. 
you know, seal it. The off. Mac yes. in front they of the McDonald's. <laughs> what does yeah. the Mac stand in front of the McDonald's? What's well, that? you you know that the Macedonians, the the Greek Macedonians. <laughs> let's not let's get political correct. It's only one. Uh, yeah, well, that well, I don't want to sound. Mate, I can get very spite, but <laughs> spiteful. But anyway, um, that's another podcast. But um, it was very well known that the Philip. Mm-hmm. Let me not say the Macedonian. Philip the second Philippos. of Macedon. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Well, they, 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 they had they had they had left a colony up in uh, Scotland. Mm-hmm. Oh wow! I didn't know this. Which they used to mine tin, and they had left a sort of guard ship a lot uh, like it like it you know they they had gone up there and they would mine the tin and all that scotland is actually derived from scotia which means the dark Mm, the dark dark wow scotos Mm. which ancient greeks means ancient greek means very dark Dark land yeah so um, they found pottery up there that's right inscriptions kidding scotland crazy scotland and then I was only joking, but it sounds like no, it's no, no, real. no, 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 no. Don't <laughs> joke, mate. Don't Especially joke. when I'm here. <laughs> Mil, Mil um, Gibson, you got to do a disclaimer here, mate. <laughs> anyway, so the McDonald's, the Mac in front of the Donalds and the Dwells and mm. whatever the the the, the pommy derivative is, Macaronia? is the Mac of Mas- Macedon. Oh, the MC wow. came from the Macedon oh. Mac. So the wow. noble the families, yeah. the noble families of the area of the mm-hmm. Scots and the mm-hmm. Welsh. Mm. Well, not all of them, but our ancestors of the ancient Greek Macedonians. Wow. Mm. So there you go. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> hence, there hence, you go. hence, because you, you mentioned the kilt. Yeah. And the, oh, I've got a really the, good the one. The gaida. The gaida. I've got yeah. a really good one for you. Bagpipes. If, you, if we've got time. Going back to ancient Greek mythology, mm. there was a guy called Marcias. Mm. And he was very well known mm-hmm. to play the bagpipe. And he was, you know, flaunting I think himself. Heard story before. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you'll be very surprised at the end of this. <laughs> anyway, so this guy would flaunt himself and say, oh, I'm the best musician in the world and all this. And so I'm going, going back to what I said to you earlier that the leader was derived by Hermes, but then was passed on to Apollo. Apollo is the representative of art in ancient Greece. So Apollo heard this. This is mythology, yeah? Mm-hmm. So Apollo heard this and said, Who the hell is this guy that's flaunting himself i'm going to go up to the caspian sea and say see who this guy is so he went up to the caspian sea and he said he asked around he said who's this marcia guy i want to you know i want to see who he is how dare he say flaunt himself you know so he found marcia and he said oh you marcia he said yes i'm marcia he said i've heard that you're a really really good bagpipe player he said yes he said do you want to hear me he said well i'm a i play the litter apollo said Okay, so let's have a contest. And Apollo said, well, you go first, sir. So he blew up his bagpipes through the nozzle and he played his thing and he's played his music. And when he was finished, he said, did you like that, Apollo? He said, yeah, it was pretty good. But he said, well, I'll play my lira now. So Apollo started to play his lira and he was playing and Apollo started to sing. And at the end of his song, Apollo said, well, mate, you've lost. You're not as good as you think. He said, what do you mean? He said, well, you were... Half the time you were playing, but half the time you were blowing into the bloody bagpipe. You couldn't sing. Mm. He goes, I was playing and I was singing, so I'm a better musician than you. <laughs> so then the, it came down to, well, I have to crucify you now because you put it onto the gods. So what Apollo did was he mm. hung him from a tree, mm. okay, and he led him you know, to, to, to death. So he went back to the Olympus and Zeus said, well, mate, you can't do that. You can't sort of, you know, you kill somebody because, you know, you, you, you got into a duel. You can't sort of do that. He said, so what do I do? He said, no, you've got you to gotta amend it. So th- four days later, he went back and he put Marcia, he brought him down from the tree and he skinned him. So he took his skin and <laughs> he made a pouch okay. from Marcia. And he always, he Apollo it? always helped him. So if you have a look at a, 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 yeah. an ancient Greek um, thing, you'll see that Apollo wears a pouch. Yeah. And that pouch he called Marsupion. Oh, come on. <laughs> <laughs> Which comes Did you from... Get it? <laughs> do you get it? <laughs> yeah. Tell us. Tell Marsup- us. Marsupials. Wow. Marsupial. So anything that's got a pouch in front of it came from the word marsupial, marsupial. So Marcia was turned into a pouch. 
but the bagpipe was very well known in ancient yeah. Greece, mm-hmm. and this this came to the Scots. And jo- there George's you go. head's just blown. <laughs> wow, there you go. this is heavy. <laughs> This is the stuff I, call, I, I tell my kids and they're, they're uh, Dad, is, what are you coming is, from? Is this their bedtime <laughs> stories at night? I don't know what it is. But and on that bombshell, I think we, I think we need to end. Okay. Guys, thank you so much for this. The, that was, that was unbelievable. Peter, was thank you so much for, for all of your insights it's and for your pleasure, passion. Mate. It's a pleasure. And George, thank you so much for all of your passion, welcome. mate, for, for all your insights. I think Very we welcome. need to... I think we actually need to, to listen to a little bit of Buzuki. But before we do, uh, George, is there any way that uh, people can contact you for, for lessons or um, if they need you for a wedding or anything like yeah, that? Yeah, um, my email is info at Calipedos Music with a C because we had to anglic- anglicize our names. <laughs> of course. <laughs> Calipedos Music. Yeah. Um, .com.au or just, um, yeah, Instagram at Calipedos Music. So Fantastic, yeah, mate. Do you want to play guys. us out with yeah. a, little of a, a little bit of music? Yeah, well done. Thank you, boys. Thank you for tuning up. Thank you.